Thank you. Uh, good morning. Can I welcome everyone to this, the 31st meeting of the Justice Committee in 2014, and ask everyone to switch off uh, mobile phones and electronic devices. Um, if they even interfere with the um, broadcasting when they're switched to silent. No apologies have been received. Oh, I beg your pardon. My, my, I beg your pardon. Alison McInnes has sent in her apologies. Um, item one, I will invite uh, Gil Patterson as a new member of the committee. Uh, to tell us if he has uh, declared any interest relevant to the work of the committee. Uh, nothing further to refer, uh, uh, Convener. Could I refer the uh, committee and the public to my declaration of interest for all to peruse? Thank you. That's in public in any event. Thank you very much. Item two. Committee is invited to agree to consider a work programme in private at our next meeting. Consider our draft reports on the draft budget 2015-16 and on the legislative consent memorandum of the serious crime bill in private at future meetings. Are you agreed? Thank you very much. I'm now going to move on to item four on the agenda with the leave of the committee as the minister has been delayed. And this will be our evidence session on the draft public services reform inspection and monitoring of prison Scotland order 2014, which we are considering under the affirmative procedure. The committee will recall we consider an earlier version of this instrument under the super affirmative procedure last year. And I welcome our first panel of witnesses. And thank you for being <laughs> so timious. So we can start with you right away. Bruce Adamson, legal officer at the Scottish Human Rights Commission. Joan Fraser, member of the Executive of the Association of Visiting Committees and Scottish Penal Establishments. Lisa McKenzie, Policy and Public Affairs Manager at Howard League Scotland. And Pete White, National Coordinator of Positive Prison, Positive Futures. We've received your written submissions. Thank you very much. Them. So I'll go straight to questions from members. John, Margaret, Elaine. Thank you, Good um, my question is to Mr Adamson and maybe for comment from the other panel members if they wish it. It's regarding the submission that the Scottish Human Rights Commission made in October 2012, Mr Adamson, and in particular paragraph three there where you uh, state, and I quote, the independence of the monitors is central to their effectiveness, and that's a requirement of OTCAT. Is what we've got in front of us, the proposal, does that indicate independence for the monitor? Can I say that your microphones will come on automatically if a question has been directed to you and if anyone else wants to come in, just indicate to me and I'll call you and your microphone will come on. I know some of you have been here before and I don't need to tell you, but you may not have been. Mr yeah. Adamson, I think it was to you, was it? Uh, it was. Uh, no, thank, thank you, convener. Thank you, thank you, committee. Good morning. Um, that question cuts to the heart of, of OPCAT and, and compliance. I mean, OPCAT itself does leave scope open as to how best to achieve compliance with it. But we do have now a, a great level of, um, of guidance from the Subcommittee on the Prevention of Torture, but also through the work that colleagues of, of ours have done in national human rights institutions in relation to how they best achieve independence. Um, and this is important because the optional protocol itself refers to the Paris principles, the UN principles on the status of national institutions, which relates to national human rights institutions. So, so there is a, a great level of, of guidance for us now. Um, what I would say in relation to the, the order that's before the committee is that um, best practice in relation to independence in our view, would dictate a, a different model which, which um, was accountable and appointed by the Parliament. But that's not the only way to ensure independence. Independence is, is a matter not just of the, the legislation, but of policy and practice as well. And there are other safeguards that can be put in place and could be put in place around this order to, to guarantee independence. Um, I think as a, as a starting point, I would like to say that the the Commission welcomes the reference to OPCAT, welcomes the commitment to, to OPCAT that governments made, and would like to stress that unlike other international treaties, um, OPCAT's operational rather than, than standard setting. So what it does is, is provides an additional framework around the existing obligations. And so what we should be thinking about when we look at this order and what we're trying to achieve in terms of the prevention of torture and the protection of other human rights of prisoners is what's the best way of having a, a monitoring mechanism? What's the best way of doing that? And um, there is uh, a lot of progress that's been made, I think, in terms of having this kind of statutory framework in terms of putting in place um, uh, protections around the appointment, around the staffing, around kind of the finances. 
but uh, a lot more needs to be done to ensure that um, functional independence and operational independence is in place. A lot more needs to be done, please, with you said. There should be safeguards. Well, um, I, I suppose that the starting point when we look at the, the Subcommittee on the Prevention of Torture's guidance, and they talk about operational independence and complete financial and operational autonomy, um, and then we look at the best practice guidance that's been developed through um, organisations like the Association for the Prevention of Torture um, and others, uh, the best practice guidance for independence of, of, of government that they suggest is, is, a link to, is a link to Parliament. If you don't have that, if you have appointment by ministers or if you have a, a link to the government, then you need to ensure that uh, there are additional safeguards put in place in relation to appointment would be the first point, that um, this means that you have a very clearly set out process for appointments in the legislation. It means that you involve the legislature, this parliament, um, and civil society through wide consultation in how you take about that appointment. It means that the, uh, the staffing needs to be done within the organisation, not externally. I think a link to Scottish ministers is possibly problematic. Um, and particularly in relation to a practice issue, um, the Committee Against Torture um, has commented in its last um, general observations on the UK about concerns that already exist uh, in relation to secondment of staff from parts of the public sector that are involved in the detention of people into national preventive mechanisms bodies. So we need to put in place protections about secondments in terms of staffing. Um, financial autonomy, um, there needs to be adequate funding in place in terms of being able to fully fulfil those functions and an insurance of, of expertise. It's a long way of kind of answering your, your question. In terms, I suppose the, what I'm saying is that if enough additional safeguards are put in place in terms of the way in which this operates, it, it could work. Is it best practice? No, no, it probably isn't. Thank you. Sam Rose, yes. Um, I, I'd just like to add, um, add a few practical examples in wh uh, which illustrate the way in which the proposed system, as in the order, would be less independent in terms of the monitoring than it is at the moment, and certainly much less independent than in the rest of the UK. So, um, first of all, the monitors will be appointed, managed, evaluated and instructed by the coordinators. The rota visiting to the prisons, which at the moment is decided entirely by the monitors, will be decided by the coordinator in agreement with the governor of the prison, which is a truly staggering proposition. Um, and um, the, rot the, the rota visits will not be entirely unannounced as they are at the moment. The unannounced visits would be in addition to visits that would be on the rota agreed with the governor. Um, so is, and also the annual reports from the monitors would not be completed by them any longer, but by the coordinators who are paid public servants. Anyone else wish to comment? I, I mean, we've opened it up to the general question of independence throughout. And I know that other members would want to come in. Uh, well, I'll ask Margaret, you're next. Yeah, followed by Lee. Is John finished? Oh, I beg your pardon, John. <laughs> no, it's okay. I think it's opened up well. well it's, um, I'm sure others will pick up. And I was going to expand on the unannounced visits. I think. That's well, I'll let Margaret come in. I think. I think Thank it's you. just opened yes. up the whole thing. But how independent is it now? Yeah. Margaret, followed by uh, Elaine. I think just commenting on that we've now got um, three possible types of visits, whereas before there was one, and you could go any time unannounced, 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 which um, doesn't see an improvement. But could I ask you in particular about how? the order deals with complaints and I think there's a, a real concern that this um, this new provision uh, would not gain the trust of, of prisoners so um, if I could perhaps ask Joan Fraser to start with that. Um, the complaints process um, <clears throat> at the moment um, um, independent monitors VC members must um, investigate complaints from prisoners 
uh, and must um, try and resolve them um, and uh, must then go back and tell the prisoner what the outcome is. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, that um, process was deleted in its entirety from the last version of the order um, and has now, in the current version, been replaced by um, a provision which says that independent monitors may investigate matters brought to them by prisoners. Um, so it's not an absolute requirement. There is no requirement to go back and tell the prisoner what the outcome is. And the means of access of the prisoner um, to the independent monitor is through asking, and this is a very old-fashioned uh, method which should have been taken out and updated in the new legislation, to um, request to see a member of the, uh, an independent monitor. The prisoner has to approach a member of the SPS staff uh, and ask them um, if they can see um, if they can uh, see a member, an independent monitor, um, which means that, uh, or they can ask to write to uh, an independent monitor. For which purpose the governor must provide paper. There is nothing that says that any of this is a confidential process, uh, as it should be. Um, it relies entirely on the SPS passing on the request. We know from prisoners that um, just as with the internal SPS system, they suffer occasionally uh, reprisals for placing in a complaint. If they ask to see a member of the visiting committee, uh, or, sorry, an independent, oh, yes, a visiting committee at the moment, um, the prison staff will sometimes make life a bit difficult for the prisoner. So things like... Um, they want to go to the gym, the list suddenly is full. They want to use the phone, it's not convenient, that kind of thing. The, uh, a prison I was at recently, the prisoner referred to it as being bammed up, which is being treated like an idiot. So you, you ask to see a member of the visiting committee or you make a formal complaint through the SPS system and there are consequences of doing that. Also, prison staff will routinely ask a prisoner why they want to see a member of the visiting committee and that they're not entitled to ask that. Um, the way we operate the system at Pullment <coughs> is a confidential process with a sealed envelope and a box, a locked box in which the prisoner puts the request and that comes directly in the sealed envelope to the visiting committee. That's the system they have in England where they have a process called applications. Uh, and that is really what ought to be in the order, but the government, for some reason, have chosen not to do that. In relation to complaints, there is also a proposal um, that independent monitors should assist prisoners with the SPS internal complaint system um, if a prisoner so requests, and we have no idea what that would amount to. There are 6,000 complaints into the SPS system every year. Um, we know this from a BBC FOI request because SPS don't publish these statistics. Uh, and we, it's impossible to say how many of that 6,000 uh, a prisoner might come to an independent monitor and say, could you help me with this? Um, it is entirely likely that there are numbers of prisoners in the system who don't use the complaint system because they, of literacy problems. Um, who, so that, that number of 6,000 could, well, who knows what number it could be, but the work could be considerable. But the, quite apart from the workload, um, what is very worrying is the way that prisoners would then begin to view independent monitors as somehow being part of the SPS system and it would undermine their independence. There's no doubt about that. Thank you. Mr White, followed by Mr Addison, want to respond as well, uh, Margaret. Mr White. <clears throat> Thank you for the invitation to be here today. Um, the process of submitting complaints for prisoners has evolved quite a lot in the last few years, and the SPS, um, it may surprise you to hear me say this, have improved the way they've dealt with complaints a great deal. I think that the idea of independent monitors uh, being uh, seen as people who will take complaints could be reviewed and could be changed into the idea of 
um, prisoners having a chance to have a confidential conversation to clarify matters and to ask for help if the clarification doesn't work. I think the conduct of the independent monitors will determine how they are viewed by prisoners. They'll have to develop a way of working which uh, builds trust. That sometimes takes a personality rather than an order to make that happen. And I think that the process of dealing with things as they arise is a good one, which is supported by the order, but not laid down in law necessarily. The word may, um, I think, can be seen in a positive way that someone can help, not that they must help, because there will be different ways in which prisoners can voice their concerns, and sometimes it will be slightly mischievous, but generally it will be for the sake of getting clarification on a point. When it comes down to filling in forms um, for uh, people in prison, there's a very good network of peer tutors who provide literacy and numeracy support, prisoner to prisoner, unarranged by SPS, and helped by people on the flats. So I, I think that some of the concerns that Joan Fraser mentions just now may not be quite as severe as she um, suggests, but I also realise there, there will be some concerns in that way. Could I just let Mr. Adamson in before? I, I, just I wanted to okay, know, right, right. since um, Ms. Fraser had raised it, the payment system where it was in the sealed in envelope and anonymity was guaranteed. Would you favour that system? Absolutely. Uh, Mr. White. I would support that system, yes. Yeah, that's helpful. Sorry. That's OK, Mr. Adamson. You want um, to come in on this as well? And, and, and to agree that I think the, the, the system is exemplified in, in, in Parliament and in, in many other parts of the world. This is the system, is, is, a, is a very good practice system. Uh, the, the Commission did have quite serious concern um, with the, the previous um, version of the order, which, which seemed to treat the, the complaints of prisoners in the same way that you would treat any other kind of public sector issue um, and not acknowledging that the particular vulnerability that, that, that prisoners are at. The, the new order where independent prison monitors may investigate complaints is, is useful, but we do share some of the concerns that, that some of the framework around that needs to be put in place very clearly. This is a requirement under OPCAT and under Article 21 that there is privacy and, and privilege associated with the communication between prisoners and the, the monitoring function. And um, it's important that we have that locked in place so that prisoners feel confident that when they communicate with um, the various monitoring um, mechanisms that that can be done in, in a way of, that is um, privileged in, in a context of privacy. Um, and I think this, this links to the perception of independence as well. And I think this is one of the, the overriding issues that, that I think we need to, to continue to focus on is that having uh, a legislative framework that supports in independence, having a policy and practice that support independence is absolutely essential, as is ensuring the perception of independence. Because without the perception of independence, then, then the whole system breaks down very quickly. Do you have any thoughts on this? Um, I mean, I echo many of the concerns raised by um, Joan Fraser. I mean, I, I also share the concern that Bruce stated at the beginning about the uh, the idea of the rota being agreed by the governor. I mean, I just, you know, the, 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 uh, we know, um, having worked on this issue for a couple of years, I know that some governors are more cooperative than others. Um, I don't know why that clause is in there. So, thank you. Yes, uh, it's fine. Uh, Elaine... Followed by John Finney, unless yeah. somebody else comes in in between. Uh, thank you. You're not in, no. You're out. Right, just Elaine, thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you, uh, convener. Uh, Professor Coyle recommended a council of independent prison monitors, uh, which would be able to discuss and progress issues. I believe that is the, the situation in England and Wales. Uh, and this order, um, the proposal is for an advisory group which would be appointed by the Chief Inspector. Uh, I wondered if you had any comments as to which was preferable in terms of right. actually well, guaranteeing independence. Well. Do you want to start again? Uh, yes. Um, the advisory group um, has its merits. Um, I think it is a good thing to assemble uh, a group of independent experts, if that's what they will be, but the order doesn't necessarily say that. The order um, says that they will be appointed by the chief inspector at his discretion for however long he decides and will be reappointed if he so decides. And this was the body um, which um, the former um, Justice Secretary said would, would person-proof and future-proof 
the structure of independent monitoring and would replace the legislative rigour that we have at the moment. Um, but in fact, uh, it seems quite unlikely that a group of individuals who owe their appointment to the chief inspector will always feel able to perform the necessary challenge function. So in terms of having um, an expert body on which you could go to for advice, um, I think that's a good idea. Um, but it's very, very different from a council, uh, which is the, the model elsewhere in the UK, um, which is the body that enables independent monitoring to operate independently of government. To comment in the panel? <clears throat> no. Is, is that an opt-out issue, the fact that that's not independent? I'm not sure I'm sufficiently no, expert. I've, I've, asked, I've asked if anybody else wishes mm -hmm. to comment on the fact that they're appointed. The prison, the prison monitoring advisory group is, uh, you know, under the auspices of the chief inspector, and it seems it's too close a connection from what you're stating between the chief inspector of prisons and prison, what we used to call prison visiting committees, now be independent prison monitors. The system seems to be tightening up and not um, allowing that independence to flow as it did before. Now, is this appointments of the the, uh, the advisory group, is that an issue for nobody else on the panel, that it's at the behest of the chief inspector, good though he or she may be? Um, yes, Ms McKenzie. It, it, it's a concern and um, a disappointment that there isn't something in the order that specifies that the appointments to the advisory body would be done on an open and transparent public appointment basis. And that is something that we did say in our most recent submission to the government. Um, and as we also said in the submission, if you have three independent prison monitors and three prison monitoring coordinators on that advisory group, our feeling was that they ought to be there as observers. If you're sitting around a table and the majority of people around the table are doing the job, you know, how's the job being done? Are we happy with how we're doing the job? And if a majority of people on the advisory group are doing the job, are they the best people to say, actually, maybe we're not doing the job the best way we can? Mm. You're saying. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm not saying they should be there, but maybe they ought to be observers on that uh -huh. group. And you ideally appoint through an open process the remainder of that group, but that's not set out in the order. Mr. Adamson. Uh, I certainly agree with that in, kind of in, in practical terms. Um, in, ter in terms of OPCAT compliance, when we're talking about independence, we're talking about independence from government and from, and from the state. I think the, one of the issues here is kind of more a conflict of interest point in, in terms of that there are the people are wearing different hats in multiple, ro multiple roles, which is, I think, very important. And there possibly it leads to, to questions around how kind of broad and transparent the appointment process is, how pluralistic we're being in bringing in different skills and different expertise. But, but I think it, it probably goes more to kind of interest, conflict of interest and um, broad, broad pluralistic <coughs> membership rather than the issue of independence from, from, from government. I understand that. Um, yes, you content? Yes. I'm looking at you, Roderick. Convener. Um, could I roll back to the question of uh, um, unannounced visits? The government, in their explanatory note to this order, state that the draft order provides that the inspection and monitoring of prisons is in pursuance of the objective of OPCAT, which is the establishment of a system of regular visits undertaken by independent international national bodies, etc. Um, Mr. Adamson, in your submission, you say the purpose of OPCAT is to establish a system of unannounced and unrestricted visits to all places where persons are deprived of their liberty by independent international and national monitoring bodies. Um, how do you reconcile those comments? Uh, I reconcile it in, in the context of the statement I was trying to make at the beginning in terms of the, the obligation that we have, the purpose of this is to have in place a system that meets the state's obligation, the positive duty to prevent torture, inhuman and degrading treatment and, and punishment. That's a, a multifaceted um, and complex process and it's an obligation that existed far before OPCAT was put in place. It comes from international custody law and it's, it's exemplified particularly through the Convention Against Torture and the European Convention on Human Rights. Those obligations to prevent torture and that positive obligation to, to have in place structures um, is something that, that already exists. Um, because uh, prisoners are particularly vulnerable and we need um, systems in place to do that. What OPCAT sought to do was to provide an additional dual layer of um, 
scrutiny through the Subcommittee on the Prevention of Torture and through an obligation on um, national preventative mechanisms at state level. And the minimum requirement under OPCAT is that they can conduct their, um, their monitoring function um, on an unannounced basis. That was, that was what we were adding through OPCAT, was ensuring that there was a, a national preventive mechanism that could do that unannounced. Um, having other types of monitoring and other types of inspection are all very, very useful. They're absolutely useful. But the additional thing that we get from OPCAT is a requirement for the state to provide powers to a national preventive mechanism and for the SPT to come unannounced. The order now provides for three types of inspection, one of which, of course, is unannounced. Yeah. And, and, uh, and my, my point would be that, that that's the, the crux of OPCAT. That's the, the OPCAT thing that, that we're adding. Those other things are useful. And our concern would only be that if resources were taken away from the unannounced visits to do the rotor visits, the other types of visits, this would be a problem in terms of the adequacy of resources required under OPCAT. Um, we're certainly not saying that, that those other types of visits um, aren't useful, although we did raise concerns about the role of prison governors in, in determining the rota. But in terms of the OPCAT requirement to have fully resourced, unannounced visits, there would be a concern that if we were taking resource away from those unannounced visits to, um, to cater to the rota and, and, and the other types of visits, then there, there may be a risk of, of calling into question whether the... Um, process is fully resourced in terms of being OPCAT, com OPCAT compliant. Okay. And the position at the present time under the existing prison rules is that at least two members of the visiting committee for a prison must visit a prison at least fortnightly. Um, and one member visits the prison weekly or two members visit the prison together in that fortnight. So to that degree, kind of regular visits are part of the system at the present time. Um, so um, what I'm trying to get at is the reality of the change. Ed, would anybody else want to comment on that? Yes, that's right. Um, when the process started a couple of years ago, I carried out uh, discussion groups inside four prisons with uh, four groups in each prison. And nearly everybody I dealt with, including staff, had never met the visiting committee in their prisons. I think that the idea of having some regular visits is a really good one. But I think having the capacity to deliver unannounced ones is an excellent one too. The way in which people are going to manage their resources is still quite flexible as far as I understand it in terms of the planning for what the system is for the new system that's coming up. And I think that if extra unannounced visits are required, then they will be supported. I don't think that they will be um, a, I don't think there'll be a shortage of capacity for that. My understanding also is that the way things are being set up just now accepts the fact that it's difficult to predict how things are going to be and setting things down in the order isn't necessarily going to be the best way of doing it because making changes to legislation is more difficult than making changes to guidance. That ties in perhaps, sorry, Miss, you want to come back and Miss Ways on that? Um, yes, um, before I deal with the announced versus unannounced, um, I just wanted to respond to Pete White's point about his discussion groups. Um, these were discussion groups from which um, VC members were excluded. We asked to be observers in these groups and we weren't allowed to. In fact, we had quite a lot of difficulty in finding out even what the questions were that were asked. But having said that, there are 1,400 um, requests to visiting committee members a year. So, you know, clearly a good proportion of prisoners do know about visiting committees. And where there's a lack of knowledge... Um, this may be not unconnected with the fact that um, notices, forms, information about VCs routinely disappear off notice boards and uh, um, from halls. Um, in relation to um, announced and unannounced visits, at the moment all of the visits are unannounced. So the way that it works is that the, the rota is set by the visiting committee and people are allocated either a week or a fortnight. Um, and they decide at what point in that time they go into the prison, and they decide where they go in that prison. And so all of visits are unannounced. The prison know that the visiting committee are going to be in and out on a weekly or fortnightly basis, but they've no idea when. Um, and the proposal is to move to a kind of three-tier system of visits 
not with increased frequency necessarily, um, but um, requiring that there are weekly visits which are on a rota. Then in addition, the monitor can do other visits which are not on the rota, but which are agreed by the coordinator. And in addition to that, they can do the kind of unannounced visits that take place all the time at the moment. Um, one of my issues with that is the practicality. Um, there is an aim, and it is uh, certainly something that's uh, laid down in OPCAT, that the um, member, the independent monitors, should be representative of civil society. So that's age, gender, ethnicity, all that sort of thing. Um, at the moment, I have to say that um, the membership of visiting committees, the people who do independent monitoring at the moment, tend in the main to be retired people um, uh, because they are the only people who have the time to devote to the job. Um, if there are going to be three layers of independent monitoring um, and uh, there are going to be additional monitoring duties assisting with the SPS system, um, there's a new provision which nobody um, I've spoken to can tell me about, which is overseeing the monitoring of uh, or monitoring temporary release of prisoners. Um, all these additional duties are to be added in. Um, I do not see how um, a cross-section of society could possibly cope in practical terms with the workload that would be required. Anybody else? Yes, Mr White. Oh, well, let Mr White come in. I'll let Mr White come in first on that then. Uh, yeah. um, I, I'm sorry that uh, Joan feels as though... Um, she wasn't given access to the discussion groups. That wasn't my decision. But we did have independent observers out with the civil service coming with us to uh, make sure that we behaved ourselves and that the process was held in a fair way. Um, and uh, maybe your point should be made elsewhere, Joan. I'm sorry. We've had that little yeah. issue raised. And, John, you want... Uh, sorry, Roddy, you finished. What's your question? I've kind of lost who was in there. John? Uh, for Ms Fraser on the specific in, uh, issue of having a, a, a monitoring that was done by a, a, a representative group of society. And in your most recent submission, you talk about the abolition of the statutory requirement and employment rights um, for monitors to be given time off by their employer. So presumably the situation will only be compounded by that. Yes, yes I believe so. Um, I, it doesn't seem sensible to me that uh, people who are doing an important <coughs> role like independent monitoring of prisons um, should not have the entitlement to time off work uh, that is available to members of independent monitoring boards in the rest of the UK. And indeed, if you were a member of the GTC or the Environment Protection Agency or a local authority, you would similarly be entitled to time off for employment Does from employment. Members of children's panels, I mean, they've got... I don't think I children's panels are on the list. don't get time off either. There must be the same issues raised for them about having sufficient people coming forward to, cro to cross ethnicity and age and so on in children's panels. I would have thought, yes. Yes. Uh, yes, I'm a member of the, the children's panel and have been for the last um, 11 years. And this was a, a discussion that came up in the context of re reform of the, the children's hearing system. And there was a... Uh, uh, differing of opinion between those that said that as soon as you start to bring in some of these additional supports, then people come in for the wrong motives. That certainly is not my view um, or the view of the Commission. As we put in, um, in our submission, uh, we think it, it's an important safeguard to ensure that... Uh, the rain by providing the at least the minimum supports in terms of loss of in terms of loss of income. Just to make a, a very quick point, if, if I may, convener, um, in terms of in terms of further supporting that, the, the OPCAT re requires this regularity that we've talked about. It requires the expertise, and I think this is very important that we need to have expertise and recognise that expertise can be built up over time and experience and good training, as well as by professional expertise. But we do need to have the kind of legal and medical expertise bought in as well. But but the the requirement in terms of a establishing the, re the, the legislation and the policies supporting it, uh, that we have a structure in place that supports the right people getting in and gives them the tools and resources to do these regular expert visits. To move on, Margaret, follow, uh, have you been in already, Margaret? So I'll take Christian first, then I'll take Margaret. Christian. Thank you very much, Governor, and good morning. Um, 
just a, a, a point about timing. Uh, we, heard, uh, we heard that the Association of Visiting Committee is telling us about uh, the consultation being a bit too short. I would, love, I would like to hear from other members to know, uh, our members of the panel, what they think about the consultation be, being too short, or if you had enough time to make submissions. Who's wanting to take that on first? I'll, 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 who wants to take it on first? Nobody wants to take it on. Ah, Mr. White does. Uh, from my point of view, I understand there's a pressure on time to get this process brought into action. And whilst the consultation period could have been longer, I think there was sufficient notice given. And I'm, I'm satisfied that given the importance of this, people were able to get on and make, make um, responses. I've got no arguments with that. I think we also, of course, looked at it previously. The committee looked yeah. at it before we even got to this stage uh, and heard quite a bit of this evidence previously before changes were made following Professor Coyle's... Yes. Um, I, I certainly felt it was quite tight. And, in fact, I only found out last night that the order had been... Uh, that some schedules to the order had been changed on the 19th of November, which I wasn't aware of. Um, I read them last night. So, you know, it, it does seem to be a movable feast. Um, and no technical well, I know, matters, but, but sometimes they turn out well, to be biggies, absolutely, yes. Absolutely, uh -huh. absolutely. And I haven't even had time to fully digest quite what those changes mean and what the practical implications are. But I know that now we've shifted two weeks into January, I think. But as I say, that, that only came to my attention last night. So, Yes, Miss Fraser. Um, as you will have seen from our submission, I thought that the consultation period was wholly unreasonable. Um, the day after the referendum, the government published um, a hun over 100 pages of information, uh, one document being their response to the previous consultation, which had been conducted some nine months previously, but they hadn't said for nine months what, was going to, what they thought of the comments they'd received. And at the same time, they published a revised draft order, which was significantly different from previous proposals. Um, and allowed a three-week consultation, even although their own standards say that they would normally consult for 12 weeks and only exceptionally would you, they shorten that. But I don't actually see any exceptional um, reasons except for the embarrassment that this has been dragging on for four years. Uh, I think allowing a bit of time for people to, um, many of whom, um, are people who are doing this in their own time. It's not part of their day job. They're not paid to do this. Um, to allow people time to reflect on 100 pages of text um, uh, and produce a response. So I think the fact that people were able to do it is, is really uh, a tribute to them. Thank you. Mr Adamson. A, a general comment, I would say, that, that it's a great credit to this, this parliament that it puts participation of, of the people as one of its, its, its founding principles. Um, I think it is a continual challenge, the, the rate at which um, legislation and policy um, comes through this parliament. And it's, it's an issue that we've raised on a, on a number of occasions in terms of taking a human rights-based approach to, to anything, that the, one of the first principles is participation. And if you want to get the participation of the people affected by these decisions, takes some time. Uh, convener, uh, what about the uh, inclusion in the order of the transition period of three months uh, to allow the new system to bed in? Any comments? It seems a sensible length of time. It was um, discussed uh, prior to that time period being put in the order. I don't see a difficulty with it. I'm happy to agree with Joan. Oh, well, we'll stop right there, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I, should, I should leave it at that. Oh, yes. Uh, Margaret. <laughs> just ask a little bit more about the additional duties being uh, um, added. Um, it seemed to me, maybe I'm wrong, this was at the, the last minute, particularly this provision about um, the arrangement for the monitoring uh, of temporary release prisoners. I think there were two, um, two concerns here. One was 
that would be adding to the practical difficulties of carrying out the unannounced as one of the now three different types of visits um, that you would want prisoners um, to have and prisons to be subject to. And the second was that um, this was rather than an, an inspection function as opposed to a monitoring function. So perhaps if you could comment on that, also on the the detail that's been left to guidance and any solution that you could think of that might help deal with these problems? Yes, if you wish, Ms Fraser. Um, on the first point in relation to temporary release, that, that um, I, have, I have no idea um, why it's in there. Um, because we do not yet have um, the government's response to the consultation process, um, we do not know whether there was something in that. Uh, I've looked at the consultation responses from the last consultation. I can't see any reference to this. Um, I have asked officials what the origin of it is, and what I was told uh, was that um, lawyers thought that this should be an inspection function um, and that, therefore, it should also be a monitoring function, uh, which sort of made me think, well, if inspection and monitoring are supposed to be separate, why would you think that, that monitoring a particular area of the prison would be, or a particular aspect of the prison system would be a natural counterpart of an inspection function? Um, but also, I have no idea what this would amount to, um, whether it's a, a review of the policies and procedures, whether it's uh, an oversight of, which would be more appropriate for monitoring, an oversight of the uh, individual cases, how many there are a year, how this would be done, oh, there are, there, it's unknown. Um, I'm sorry, your second question. The um, guidance, too much detail um, and your solution to these problems. Well, the issue about so much of it being in guidance is that it can easily be changed um, and you know on one aspect in general principle guidance is useful um, because you don't have to come back to parliament every time you want to change a system but when you're dealing with a matter that's as important as the human rights of prisoners uh, it does seem to me to be very important that there should be a, a very um, stable and um, clear legal framework against which the system would operate. In terms of a solution, uh, I, there isn't a solution really in the terms of the existing order. I can't see a way in which um, you would have to insert a provision, for example, to say that the guidance was statutory, which means that the guidance itself would have to come before Parliament, but that would require a change in the order, which, as I understand it, cannot be done under this procedure. Um, so the, the, the solution would be to put far more of the structure of the system and the requirements um, in legislation as it is at the moment. Not withdrawn, could it be continued perhaps to, to, to reflect further on some of these last minute changes? I think my understanding um, is that the legislative process does not allow for the order to be amended at all, in which case it would have to be withdrawn or um, uh, not approved by the Parliament. But I think it would be sensible um, for there to be time, despite the fact that we've been looking at this for a very long time, uh, I think it would be worth spending a few extra weeks to have a system which, in Scotland, we could say, we are leading the field here. This is the gold standard to which the government said it aspired. Mr White, are you about to agree with uh, Ms Fraser as you did previously? I'm going to divert not, slightly. Not divert. <laughs> <laughs> and then I've got Mr Adams. I think the reason for um, there being some responsibility or some opportunity for monitors to have dealings with the temporary release of prisoners is that whilst they're temporarily released, they're still prisoners. And at that point, I think that the, um, the access monitors might have to these people would be very helpful. And I think it continues the regime. And it um, may seem strange that somebody who's released from prison on a temporary order is still a prisoner. But I think it's important that that continuity is there. Mr Adamson. 
Certainly, the, the, the scope of OPCAT covers covers all, all detention, and that includes restrictions that are out with the, the prison environment. I, I, I would um, just refer very briefly to just some core principles in relation to answering this question, and that it is that, that OPCAT and the SBT guidance guidelines that, that underpin OPCAT um, set out very clearly the preference for constitutional or legislative text to, to frame as much as possible. Um, due to the, the nature of this process, obviously we're in a subordinate legislation kind of process with reference to guidance. The further we get away from a kind of constitutional or legislative protection, um, the less scrutiny that's available, the more concerning that becomes for ensuring the system's working effectively. A committee can ask to scrutinise guidance, even if yep. it's not statutory guidance as such. Yep. So a committee can take a view, or even Parliament, that they, you know it's quite substantial what's in the guidance, and they, they may wish to, to I, deal with it. I absolutely take that, that point, Kavina, and I, I know that, that, that your remit extends to, to all of those things within, within your scope, and you could require it, I think that it would be useful to have a statutory requirement for that to come back rather than to, to leave it to the, um, the best officers of, of, of yourselves. Um, I, think, I think the other very quick point that I would like to make, if I, if I may, is, is the link between um, having clear mandate in terms of what the, what the responsibilities are and the necessary resources to support that. If additional functions are going to be added in, they need to be very clear at this level and resources need to attach to that. I understand that. I think that's no. I think there's only one thing that we may not have asked, and you want to ask it, yeah, Elaine? Yeah, that just we're... briefly, um, <clears throat> yeah, the order doesn't specify a minimum number of uh, IPMs. I just wondered whether you felt that it ought to do so, or if there were uh, disadvantages of actually specifying a number. I'll, I'll take some. I, I feel you've such a weight of responsibility <laughs> being first every time, so I'll take Ms. McKenzie this time. We've, we've consistently argued to try and put in, we, we accept that it may not be sensible to put in a number for every institution because obviously, well, the Harrow League aspiration is that our prison numbers will go down. But we did come up with a formula in the implementation group which had a kind of, you know, a baseline of numbers for kind of viability of a visiting committee. I'm not sure why that's not gone into the order when we feel able to specify the number of prison monitoring coordinators. Um, obviously, it's good to see a, a reference to frequency in the order now, and that wasn't there before. And obviously, that, to some degree, helps you determine how many people might carry out these functions once you've defined these different visit types of visits, the meetings they might have to do, the oversight of the temporary release, which is as yet <coughs> unclear in terms of capacity. But yes, we would have liked to have seen, if not a number, then a formula, and as I say, a formula was bandied around uh, our discussions in the implementation group, but there's been resistance to actually putting that into the order. The population of the prison. At yes, time. and what then whether young offenders and women might have a, a kind of uplift in terms of number because they're particularly vulnerable. Um, I think we, I think when we last discussed it, we talked about a minimum of eight, but then you would vary it regard, you know, in terms of you know, Barlini would obviously have a larger number than say, um, you know, a low moss or one of the smaller prisons. Yeah, Mr. White. I agree with um, Lisa um, about the process. I think the one reason for the um, numbers being omitted from the order um, is based on the fact the prison estate is changing all the time. And if we're going to have a minimum number, that might be seen as the threshold for acceptance. And I think there's far more to be gathered from experience as people find out what's required. So the formula was a good idea, but I don't think it can... Uh, stick with the fact that the number of prisons is changing and the number of people inside is changing. Ms Fraser. Um, the formulas that we looked at were flexible enough to allow for that. I mean, you, you could ha um, the system at the moment is very um, out of date. It's based on historic local government boundaries, I think possibly two lo local government reorganisations ago. So it produces some very odd figures. So at the moment, the legislation says there should be uh, six members uh, of the visiting committee at Aberdeen, but 28 at Barlinie. Uh, and that clearly doesn't make any sense because there is a sort of irreducible minimum of things that monitors have to do. Um, but the formulas that we looked at, and we looked at several, um, were all based on prison population and having a minimum number of monitors per prison and then um, adjusting that upwards in the light of changes in numbers or um, the particular needs of the prison population. So you might argue that young offenders and female prisoners would require more intensive monitoring 
um, than other types of prisons. But there are arguments in all, I mean, in Barlini, there are so many people there with mental health problems that you might argue that they also needed more monitoring. It is aware of that. So, you know, yeah. I, I mean, I it's see no reason why there can't be a formula that would offer some sort of guarantee. It is slightly worrying to me that there seems to be a feeling that we would keep the number of independent monitors as small as we could, but at the same time resourcing all the paid staff uh, to quite an extraordinary um, bill at the end of the day, possibly 10 times what it costs at the moment. And it's good that the government is willing to spend money on a, a, a new system, but I'm not sure that the priorities are quite right there. You don't need to say anything, Mr. Adams. Well, 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 only say at, 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 at risk of, of incurring a wrath in, in terms of repetition. We need to have we need to have regular monitoring, and it needs to be needs to be resourced. But the commission would, would take the view of, of the experts on on the number of that. But I'm going to conclude the evidence session. Thank you very much, Attends. Thank you for stepping in um, at short notice. Um, do you want to suspend for five minutes? Suspend for five minutes to change the witnesses. <laughs>
In March now, we're back and we have our second panel of witnesses in front of us. I know that you're uh, listening in part to the evidence of the previous panel. And I welcome Professor Andrew Call, Professor Emeritus, Professor of Prison Studies at King's College London, Dr James McManus, Member of the European Committee of Prevention of Torture, and David Strang, Majesty's Chief Inspector of Prisons for Scotland. And I'll go straight to questions from members, please. John Pentland, Margaret, Elaine, John Finney. Thank you. John. Thank you, Convener. Uh, morning, panel. The Scottish Government has stated that it is committed to taking forward reform uh, of the system for independent monitoring of prisons to meet the obligations under the optional protocol to the UN Convention Against Torture. And I think for time, uh, uh, for time we'll call that OPCAT. <laughs> uh, and I find this report uh, full of acronyms, which is quite difficult to get your head round. Yes. Uh, uh, can be there, but however, we'll get there. I've not, I've however, <laughs> the, 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 there seems to be uh, some concern about whether that it's compliant with OPCAT, and I'd probably like to maybe hear the panel's views to whether we think that's the case or not. Would you like to take this? Again, it, it, the light will come on. Um, the, the, the United Kingdom's obligations under OPCAT uh, are met through membership of its national preventive mechanism. The national preventive mechanism is made up, I think, of 20 um, bodies which are uh, involved in um, monitoring places where people are deprived of their liberty. There are I think um, about five of those members are based in Scotland, including the Chief Inspector of Constabulary, the Chief Inspector of uh, Prisons, uh, the Human Rights Commission, the Mental Welfare Commission, and the Care Commission. The current members of the visiting committees who monitor prisons in Scotland are not members of the National Preventive Mechanism. My understanding is that under these proposals, and the Chief Inspector here will correct me if I've misunderstood, that under the new arrangement, independent prison monitors will not be members of the National Preventive Mechanism, or at most they will be represented by the Chief Inspector. That's unlike the arrangements for England and Wales and Northern Ireland, where independent monitoring boards are represented directly on the national preventive mechanisms. It's also, I should say, unlike the independent custody, custody visitors to police cells uh, who were uh, set up in Scotland following the, the 2012 Police Act, they are members of the national preventive mechanism. So to that extent, the, if I've understood it correctly, the uh, new order will not um, change the arrangements, will take us no further than we are at the moment in terms of the national preventive mechanism of OMCAT. Should it? Yes. Mr. Strang. Uh, thanks very much indeed. I think, I think to answer um, Mr. Pentland's question, um, my understanding is that it will mean that the monitoring of prisons in Scotland is OPCAT compliant. And I know that the chair of the UK MPM has expressed a view that uh, the new arrangements for independent prison monitors will be uh, OPCAT compliant. And I understand that part of the government's reason for changing from visiting committees, which were not OPCAT compliant because they, their funding uh, came through the Scottish Prison Service, the, the body they were monitoring. Um, part of the, the reason for introducing the new system of independent, independent prison monitoring was to make sure that it did comply with OPCAT. In terms of um, uh, Andrew Coyle's comments about the national preventive mechanism, um, and which he rightly says, I, I'm one of uh, uh, the members, I, I represent uh, Scotland on the steering group of, of the UK National Preventive Mechanism. Um, at the moment, the visiting committees uh, are not in any way represented. They're not members of uh, 
the National Preventive Mechanism because they're not OPCAT compliant. Um, the new arrangement, as you know, is to put um, responsibility for monitoring prisons as well as inspecting prisons under uh, my office. And so, in, in a sense, um, they, they will have a voice now at the National Preventive Mechanism because, um, clearly, as the Chief Inspector of uh, Prisons for Scotland, I will have responsibility not just for inspecting prisons, but also for ensuring the effective monitoring of, of prisons. Yes, Dr. McManus. Thank you, Madam. As you said in your introduction, I am the UK representative on the Council of Europe, the Committee for Prevention of Torture there. And one of our tasks as we go around member states is to look at the preventative mechanism, the NPM, established under OPCAT. Now, we have no formal role in monitoring them, but we've been asked by SPT to, to do that as we work within the, the 47 member states of Europe. Our experience, of course, is that they, they differ quite, quite widely. They, most of them are run by the Ombudsman's Office in the relevant countries, but the structure of them is quite different from one country to the other. When I looked first at the Scottish mechanism, I could see a strong possibility for the old-style visiting committee becoming the NPM, because it brought together the people who are actually doing the job, who are doing it on a day-to-day -day or a week-to-week -week basis, and that would have been the kind of model that would comply mostly with what's going on in other countries in Europe. And when I first saw the structure proposed in the, in the, the regulations we're debating today, I thought that didn't do what I would want to have done. All it did was take the financing away from the, the current arrangement. It was the National Preventative Mechanism, you said, wasn't it? The NPM, not NPM. the MPM. NPM. Yes. Yes. We're yes. so blurred with all Sorry. these. Sorry. It's the NPM. Yeah. We all right now? Right. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, the one hurdle that has been identified by the UK NPM is the financing of the current visiting committees, and that left them non-compliant. The order proposes to change that, but in a way it structures it in a, a way that doesn't achieve the ultimate objective, which is to maximise the input of the NPM itself, because it's putting in the professional uh, uh, coordinators who will be the main mechanism through which the NPM uh, performs its role. So the people actually doing the work are further distanced from the NPM role by the creation of this new group of professionals, who of course will also be salaried by government, but not through SPS. So it's that technical change which I think is, is in danger of further uh, reducing the impact of the people doing the work of the NPM, rather than those who are defined as the NPM. John? Do you believe then, uh, Dr McManus, that that creates a conflict? If, uh, you know, if somebody's been paid to, to, to do something, then there's a tendency that they may provide a report that suits their payment? I, we certainly haven't seen that in the office of the Chief Inspector of Prisons in Scotland, I have to say, over the years. Um, no, I, I don't think it's a fundamental compromise, but it's just it doesn't look as good in terms of conspicuous independence which I think is an essential element of an effective NPM. How would you change it? Sorry, my ignorance. How would you change that so that the independent prison monitors would be, you know, members of, say, the National Preventive Mechanism? How, how do you physically change that in this legislation? You, you simply, can't. You simply specify in legislation that the, the so you'd put it actual in here. independent monitors are the members of the NPM. And you put it in here, would you, in this yes. draft yes. affirmative yes. instrument? Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thanks, John. Um, Margaret, followed by Lane, John Finney and Christian. Good morning, panel. Uh, you, you probably have heard if you were um, in the committee room when the previous <laughs> panel were giving evidence some um, concerns about independence. And it seems to me that perhaps in seeking to make uh, the monitoring system uh, compliant with OPCAT, there are some unintended consequences, particularly about independence. Um, could I ask you to look at, and I accept that some uh, panel members have welcomed frequency of visits, for example, being um, laid down, but now having three types of visits where um, previously anyone could go in unannounced, and also the capacity issue with the new duties and the blurring of inspection and monitoring. 
Well, that's lots of questions, but that's all right. So if you just take them a bit at a time. Sh shall I start on? Uh, just you go for it, Mr Strang. Thank thanks very much indeed. Uh, in terms of independence, and, and that is clearly a really important issue, and for me, the independence of the monitors rests on the on the independence of my office, if you like. So um, as um, a Majesty's Chief Inspector of Prisons for Scotland, I am independent of the Scottish Prison Service, and I'm independent of the Scottish Government. So in conducting my inspections and making reports, I will comment on what I find in terms of the treatment of prisoners, the conditions in prison, um, independently of th those, two, those two bodies. And so uh, if I have a, a, a criticism or praise for the, the Scottish Prison Service, I'll make that in, in my reports. And similarly, if I uh, comment on, on Scottish Government policy, I'm not uh, constrained fr from doing that. Um, in terms of, of payment, part of the duty of uh, a state that signs up to OPCAT and, and the National Preventive Mechanism is that they do have to fund independent monitoring and inspecting. Um, so, the, the, you know, the, we, we have an arrangement where um, scrutiny and, and oversight of prisons, whether inspecting or monitoring, is funded uh, by the government. So, so I, I don't think there's a conflict between the state providing funds to enable uh, independent uh, inspection and independent monitoring uh, to take place. So I, th I think that's an important principle. I, I don't feel my independence is compromised by the fact that I'm not doing this voluntarily in, in my own time. In terms of, of visits, um, the, uh, the important um, figure I think in here is that Prisons have to be monitored regularly, and, and uh, the order says uh, every week every prison has to, has to be monitored. And so I don't think there'll be confusion um, in terms of, I know you talked about three types of visits. I don't think there are three types of visits. I think there is a, a monitoring uh, visit. Um, now, that might be as a result of, of uh, uh, in response to the, to the rotor. That, that has been agreed, but it might be that they want to come back two days later to follow up something, and it's just saying that you're not restrained only to come uh, in accordance with the, the rotor. So uh, an independent prison monitor would be able to um, attend uh, at other times than, than according to the rotor. And I think your, your third point about resourcing um, is a really important one. It's one, that, of course, that I should be taking up in my uh, discussions with the Scottish Government. If, if Parliament gives to me a new duty and uh, the, uh, a new scheme for independent prison monitors with uh, coordinators, then clearly that, that needs to be uh, funded. So I think it's the duties of the monitor that will lead us to the number we need, um, given that there need to be a visit every week. Uh, and, and the resourcing. I think the important point about the paid coordinators is that this is in response to the fact that um, at the moment visiting committees are very varied across the 15 uh, prisons and young offenders institutions in Scotland. And uh, you know, the purpose of introducing the coordination is to make sure that there is uh, a, a good standard of uh, consistent monitoring right, right across Scotland in every establishment. Anybody else wish to come in? Professor Conn. I wonder if I might answer Ms Mitchell's question by briefly um, stating how I come to be involved in this. Um, very briefly, that in September 2012, the government asked me, as you're well aware, to review whether its proposals in this respect were in conformity with the optional protocol and specifically its obligation to establish a system of regular visits undertaken by independent bodies. It was made clear to me um, from the outset that the government's intention to abolish visiting committees in their present form was not negotiable, but it was agreed that I could interpret my terms of reference in a wide manner. Um, I submitted my report in January 2013, and the government published its response in April, indicating that it accepted 17 of my 21 recommendations and would further consider the remaining four. It further announced its intention to establish a new independent monitoring system consisting of four salaried prison monitors supported by an unspecified number of lay monitors. 
to be overseen by HMI. That was not an arrangement which I had recommended. It seems to me that much of the remaining confusion which we have relates to both the appointment and the role of these prison monitoring. The, 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 the four salaried monitors have metamorphosed into, um, in, into the prison monitoring coordinators. Um, but the order, as I read it, gives them more than a coordinating role. It actually also gives them the right to go into prisons um, to monitor. What I recommended was the public appointment of independent volunteer monitors for each prison in sufficient numbers to enable them to carry out their specified duties. I recognised that the monitors would need to have a supporting body and I presented a number of options, one of which was the Inspectorate um, of Prisons. Now, over the last 20 months, the government has bit by bit responded to the many concerns which have been raised, not least um, by yourselves, by giving us a dynamic series um, of amendments, which takes us a good way um, down the road, but still retains a complication which I suggested in my review was not necessary. Can I just excuse Professor Coyle that, that um, this merging of the inspectorate and monitoring, although it was one of the options, it wasn't your favoured option? Um, I, 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 I was at pains, Ms Mitchell, to, to make a distinction uh, between inspection and monitoring, which I think is, 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 is generally um, accepted. Um, I recognise that one of the difficulties in the past was that there was no um, um, sponsoring or supporting group for the, um, uh, for, for, for the visiting committees. Indeed, that was provided insofar as it was at all by the prison service itself, the body that was being, uh, that, that was being monitored. Uh, and, and I gave a number um, of options. One was broadly parallel to that in England and Wales, that there would be a small unit within the Scottish Government which could do that. That's the, um, the broad um, model in England and Wales. Another was that the Human Rights Commission could do it. Another one which I did not um, push but would have been possible would be for the SPSO to do it. And um, uh, the, fourth, the fourth one was the Chief Inspector of Prisons. Um, I recognise that that would be uh, a proper one but I was at pains to point out that in, in placing it there, uh, which I did not oppose, in placing it there, there would need to be great care taken not to elide the distinction between inspection and monitoring. And that raises the, the problem now that's emerged. Um, I, I, I've stated my view about the monitoring coordination. Okay. Yes, certainly. Uh, Sorry. Uh, uh, and I agree entirely with, uh, with Andrew Coyle that the first order that you considered at this time last year um, needed amendment and, and clearly has been amended. And, and the notion that there were prison monitors who would be the main monitors supported by lay monitors, I think, was very confusing. And I think what has changed here is that the responsibility for monitoring clearly rests with the independent prison monitors so that the volunteer members of society, the representatives of civil society who will be in prisons every week. The, the, the change of title to the, the prison monitoring coordinator, I think, does indicate what their role will be, will be about uh, coordinating. Now, clearly, they do have a power to go into a prison. Um, and the, the issue about in, uh, inspection and monitoring coming under the same organisation is, I know, one that, that you commented on in your report um, earlier in the year, which was saying that there were real benefits. And I think there are real benefits. I, I, I'm very clear that they are separate functions. One is a pro professional inspection that's done infrequently and, and, uh, and in great debt. Monitoring is a regular visiting and, and scrutiny uh, and done by, by local people who are uh, familiar with, with the prison. And I think um, there are real benefits for having that coordinated um, so that the findings from monitors, for instance, can be fed into the inspection programme uh, and we can, I think we'll have a, a, a better sense of the monitoring and inspecting of, of prisons across Scotland as a result. Can you 
agree that notwithstanding that there could be walls or Chinese walls between the inspectorate and monitoring, that the perception will be that it's blurred to become one and the same, whereas previously the visiting committee has been completely separate from the inspection and the inspectorate. But now, because of the sort of hierarchy that has been built, which you can see for good reasons why it is to try and make uniformity and some kind of um, education and process for it and so on, but nevertheless, by establishing a hierarchy, it's seen as that you know the independent prison boards are just part of the inspectorate. Um, I, I, no, no, I, I mean, I understand it, and, and many people have, have expressed that, that fear, and I, I, I do understand it. I think part of the, the separation, as you describe, from, of the visiting committees actually led to isolation. And I know that speaking to visiting committee members was a frustration that their voice wasn't heard. And um, if they had concerns, they might take it to the governor, the governor might ignore it. So I think there were, there was, there were disadvantages to that isolation, whereas now there will be an avenue. So if, if monitors are unhappy with the response they get from a prison, they can, uh, that can be escalated through the coordinator, it can come to me. Uh, and so I think there is a, a, an avenue for, for um, a greater voice. And I think the reality within prisons is that um, prisoners will have confidence in the work of independent prison monitors by the way they conduct um, their business. If they're there uh, regularly, uh, they won't particularly see the link through to the, um, uh, the, the chief inspector. I mean, I, I think, I mean, you're, you're, you're technically right that, of course, from a uh, bureaucratic organizational sense, that's the, the way the governance is provided. Um, but I think in terms of the effective work of independent prison monitors, whether it's in, in the Nest Prison or in Greenock or in, in the New Grampian, will be by the work they're doing on the ground. And I don't think a prisoner will particularly make a link with, oh, this person is trained by someone who works it for, for the chief inspector. Coyle well, provided an alternative governance, which would have kept that separation, as it were, clarity of separation of well, the monitoring and inspection yeah. and perhaps have made your position easier in some respects because you know in a way this could be seen to compromise you well i, I don't think it compromises me in any way i think my independence is still to, well, i'm not saying I, it does i'm not impugning you in no, any no 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 I, I i didn't take it in a personal sense i just meant that in terms of the functions that i do i think it will enhance the oversight and scrutiny of our prisons because rather than these two functions being completely separate and not particularly talking to each other, that they will be uh, coordinated. And, and I had taken from your report that, that you had welcomed the fact that the two would be better coordinated. Um, and so I, you know, I imagine that's why the government has continued to pursue this. So I, I, don't think the, I don't think either the inspection function will be compromised, nor do I think that independent prison monitoring itself will be compromised. But I think it's the, the detail that's been added later on and just looking further through the implications of um, the, the coordination even in you know, the rota having to be approved by the governor, the um, permission having to be sought by the coordinator and at the very bottom this unannounced visit which is the norm just now that is causing quite a bit of concern. Yeah, I mean, I, I think oh, the... Yeah. Okay. Right. So we'll move on. Of course you can. Gil Patterson, yes. To unannounced uh, uh, visits. Uh, my experience tells me that institutions are better kept on their toes when an, uh, inspections or visits are unannounced, wholly unannounced. But I wondered if the purpose of the, uh, the three uh, types of visits would it be would it be right in saying that an unannounced visit may cause some matters to be raised, and so then the announced visit takes place to try and come to terms of what was found by the announced, unannounced a, a visit. Is that, I, is that why it's three different types? Or can you explain what they are? Um, I mean, in terms of visits by independent prison monitors, they are going to be in a prison every week. That's, that's the requirement on, on them to visit every week. So, um, I mean, the reality is that a prison is not going to suddenly change how it does something because they know the monitor's coming in on Wednesday afternoon. I mean, it, the, the, the regular monitoring of uh, prisons by the independent prison monitor means that they'll be able to notice change over time. Um, they will speak to prisoners. They can speak to staff. Um, and 
if something's not right, a prisoner will soon tell them if they feel that they've been mistreated, um, if the, the food is poor. It's not that the monitor's objective is to come in and, and catch um, prison servers out red-handed doing something they shouldn't do. It's about regularly being aware of what is happening in the prison, what are the facilities like, um, how many uh, prisoners are attending education, um, what is the, the provision of health care in the prison, is, what's the waiting time for the dentist. So it's more um, monitoring in that sense rather than expecting, because you can't enter a prison completely unannounced because you have to you know, be let in the front door. So, so th that sense of, um, as I say, catching people kind of red-handed, that's what you have in mind, um, isn't part of what we would expect the monitors to be doing. Off unannounced, but all I did was have the security inspector. Well, I'd been told by Kilmarn at prison that I could come at any time, and I yeah. did, which was rather interesting as it caused a bit of a stushy um, generally. So it sometimes is useful, and all I did was the security check. Yeah, no, no I'm sure you're right, but I, what I'm saying is that you know, if, if monitors only went once a year, then that might make a difference, but monitors are going every week in, take into your a point. prison. Uh, I'll take Dr. McManus then, Professor Coyle. Thank you, madam. Um, I, I think both kinds of visits are very, very important. And certainly with CPT, we do both kinds of visits. And that's going to a country, sometimes totally unannounced, and, and going to a prison, which, as you'll understand, requires some negotiation to get into the prison to begin with. But it's also very important to do announced visits where you're asking for information in advance, which enables you more efficiently to monitor what's going on. Uh, and it's more important, too, in terms of finding out what's really happening in a prison to vary times and days ra of your visit rather than to have announced or unannounced visits. So turning up on a, a Sunday, turning up on Christmas Day, turning up on the days when the routine is a bit quite different from usual, and turning up at a time of the day, including, for example, during the evening or the night. And clearly that kind of visit has to be announced. There's, there's no point in ringing the bell of Berlini at midnight and asking to come in. That, that would pose all sorts of difficulties for the police. So the, the, the thing is to get a balance of the visits, and that's what visiting committees were beginning to do, I think. I did a research project on visiting committees way back in the 80s, which found tremendous variations in practice, and some very, very good committees, and some other committees. One particular committee, I remember, produced the same minute for their monthly meeting for five years visited all parts of the prison, everything was in good order, everything was perfect, and signed off. For five years, that prison was in perfect condition. Uh, I wouldn't identify the prison, but it certainly, in my view, was not in perfect condition. So it's a matter of getting the, the variation right and getting the professionalism of the people built up, but professionalism based upon ordinary citizens, not professional monitors, but ordinary citizens who bring the outside perspective to the prison world. That was a big value of the visiting committee. Let's not use, lose that under the proposed new arrangement. Professor Coyne. Um, just to expand on what Dr. McManus has just said, convener, in, in answer to Mr. Patterson's question, um, inspection is sometimes described as a snapshot in time, and, and that's not meant unkindly. The chief inspector, the inspector team will go into prisons on a three or four monthly rota and will inspect it during that period, having looked at all the paperwork and all the reports and so on. But it's very much um, a snapshot in time, informed, of course, by previous inspections and, and, and other information. Monitoring um, is something which is done regularly and continuously. It's people who are in prison. Uh, on a continuous basis, seeing, smelling things. Something's wrong today, something's different today. Because they know the prison or know the, the hall, then they pick these uh, issues up. Linked to that, Jim McManus's point, that these and the strength of visiting committees in the past, in principle, but sadly not always in practice, but in principle, is that they are representative of the local community. Um, if the prison in Dumfries is taking prisoners from Dumfries, then the visiting committee should be people from, from that area who are going in regularly. Those are the, the, the distinctions between the two functions. They absolutely need to be complementary, 
but they need to remain distinct. Happy. Thank you. Elaine, John Finney, Christian. Elaine. Chris, can I uh, raise the concerns I think that Professor Collins raised previously about the ability of the IPMs to hear and pursue complaints? Uh, the draft order seems to concentrate on the ability of the IPMs to assist prisoners to undertake the formal complaints process, uh, and less so on the ability to raise any issue with the governor or investigate any issue which a, a prisoner raises with them. I wonder if you could maybe comment on uh, whether there's an issue, whether, whether there is a, a, a weakening of, uh, of the current legislation in terms of, of raising complaints to prisoners. Mr. Strang. The, the, um, this issue was raised as a result of the first order and people feeling that that had been removed. They, just looking at the order 7D3, um, which is the duties of the independent prison monitor, and it says that an independent prison monitor may investigate any matter referred to the independent prison monitor by a prisoner. So a prisoner will say, um, you know, I have something I want to raise, and the uh, independent prison monitor uh, can investigate that. So I think that uh, is very clear that it allows um, and expects independent prison monitors to hear concerns from prisoners and to investigate and, and take whatever action uh, is necessary. Um, I think the, the reason that the emphasis about supporting prisoners to um, make a complaint through the formal SPS complaint system is that what I don't think is helpful is to establish a parallel complaint system. Um, I think um, um, that prisoners should be encouraged to use the Scottish Prison Service complaint system. The SPS need to have a complaint system that is fit for purpose, and this, this might be something. If, if there were constant complaints that the SPS complaint system wasn't working, that might be something that the inspector might have a look at, and we perhaps could do a thematic inspection on how well is the prison services complaint system uh, working, how well is it trusted by prisoners, and so on. Um, so I think we're right to avoid setting up an alternative complaint system, but I, th I think it's very clear in the order, and it will be in the guidance for monitors, that they will be expected to hear concerns about prisoners, to investigate them, and to take whatever action uh, they consider to be necessary. Yes, Professor Cohen. The, the description complaint is, is a very um, simple word for what can actually be quite a complex process. Um, I think it was John Fraser who mentioned that last year there had been something in the region of 1,400 um, complaints raised with visiting committees. Now, the reality is that in terms of resolving issues, one of the, the main um, uh, objects both of um, the prison service and of monitors is to reduce issues which can give rise to complaint. So a prisoner may come to raise an issue. Because a prisoner raises an issue with an independent monitor, monitor he or she may not define that as a complaint, and indeed if it's properly dealt with, it will not become a complaint. It only becomes a complaint when uh, it's not being properly dealt with uh, according to the, the, the prisoner's perception. Now, as I understand it, the, the prison services complaints com system deals with complaints. Much of the work of the visiting committee at the moment in talking to prisoners and listening to prisoners is actually in, in, in eliminating or preventing complaints. And I'm sure, I suspect, um, that the, what, what's, what's defined in the order as complaint probably encapsulates that wider uh, idea in addition to the, the specific issue of I, I want to make a complaint about something. Do you think, I mean, does the order as it's now drafted, is that concentrate to orders that give the appearance of wanting to escalate things into complaints rather than providing mediation? I mean, is there a, con a concern that... that Tipping um, the balance towards complaining I mean, uh, rather than mediation. I, I, I'm not sure I've got a strong view on that uh, because it would be hard to. Your next question might be, well, what's the alternative formulation? And I'm not sure what the alternative formulation might be. Uh, what is important is that the um, the prisoner retain should retain the right to approach the independent prison monitor in a confidential manner 
without having to go through um, a third party. And there should be an arrangement for doing that, as there is at the moment. From the legislation that is um, set before us? Um, I, I, see, I, 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 I suspect the fact that we're talking about mm. it means that, that we have questions, and if we've got questions, then you can be pretty sure prisoners on the landings will have questions. Because that's the issue that obviously has been raised with us, is that prisoners may not have confidence if they feel they have to go through the formal complaints system and fear that there may be retribution for having done so, that they may be less willing to come forward with The confidentiality is, is essential in this. I, 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 mean, I, I agree entirely. I mean, the, the system absolutely needs to have the confidence of uh, those detained in prison and therefore confidentiality is, is essential. So, I mean, that, that will be part of the system. I mean, um, uh, that before, before independent prison monitoring starts, there will need to be uh, um, guidance uh, established and part of that will be that there will be um, confidential referrals um, as and the order says that... Um, prison monitors should be able to speak confidentially to prisoners. So, I mean, the referral system needs to be uh, confidential as well. In the, in the, in the, the draft, in the regulation itself, that, it, that, that the right to confidential investigation, should that not actually be on the, on the regulation rather than just in guidance? Well, I, I mean, that, that, that's a, a technical legal matter. I mean, there are lots of things that have been talked about uh, as to whether they should or should not be on the face of the order. I mean, that, that my, I suppose my comment was saying that when we get to implementing this, we will absolutely make sure that the prisoners can have confidence that their referrals are, are confidential, in the same way as they should be when they want a referral to uh, see a medical practitioner. If they want a referral to a nurse or a doctor, a prison officer should not know the reason why they want to go uh, to the health centre. Sorry, Lee, I think I was trying to recall the evidence from Ms Fraser that, in fact, what a prison visiting committee member could do just now is go with the complaint directly to the governor uh, you know, but what seems to be the process now is that it would have to be done through the formal complaints procedure by the prisoner, assisted by the visiting committee member, and the response would be to them. I, I may have that wrong, but that was the impression I got from the evidence that we got from Ms Fraser. And that concerned her that um, in certain circumstances, the prison visiting committee member could have raised it directly and had a response back to them to convey to the prisoner but that can't be done that way now if it's a complaint rather than an investigation. And just, you know, am I wrong? Yes, Professor Coyle. That, that's, you put your finger on it, convener, that, that, that there is a danger that what this will do by default is immediately raise so many of these issues to the level of a complaint rather than, than preventing that happen um, in the first place. Yes, so it is what I thought. No, uh, yeah, that's fine. I like to not have been paying attention. Um, Margaret, have you finished? Oh, sorry, Dr. McManus, you want to come in. Uh, I simply wanted to repeat something that David said earlier, that um, we have to be extremely careful not to subvert the SPS complaints procedure by allowing dual tracks. And so jumping the, the queue, if you like, by going through an IPM straight to the governor would not be effective in improving the prison complaints process. So we have to, we have to bolster the SPS process rather than subvert it. Uh, and that's why I, I see the role, as has been explained, of the IPM has been to raise issues which prevent complaints from coming out, rather than dealing with complaints. It doesn't cover themselves. the issue, I think, forgive me, raised by uh, Margaret Mitchell, but confidentiality, which, if it's put through by the prisoner, the, I think the evidence we were, some of the evidence we're hearing is there might be repercussions for the prisoner, um, uh, you know, if it went through the system that way, rather than through, I think that's the point you're making, Margaret. Process within SPS for raising matters directly with the governor. Mm. If it's a, a confidential matter, it can be raised directly with the governor, and only the governor would then know about it. And the order provides um, that the monitors may investigate any matter, so it's not just uh, confined to complaints. Yeah. And at 6b, the monitors may, without prior notice, speak in private with any prisoner. Um, who agrees to speak to an independent prison monitor. So I think that confidentiality... But, I mean, the issue about, about reprisals is one that, as a member of the... Going back to the National Preventive Mechanism, that's one of its principles, is that uh, a whistleblower or anyone who wants to make a complaint shouldn't be subject to uh, reprisals and, and uh, further implications. Margaret, 
wanted to come back yes, for it. The performance system was uh, mentioned as something that more or less guaranteed anonymity. It was in the envelope. Uh, could you comment on that, if you think that's something perhaps to be adopted in the order? I, I think um, there needs to be a mechanism. I, I don't think it should be in the order, though, because um, prisons are very different in size. Um, you know, Vanessa's is, is 140 people, Barlini, um up to 1,400. So uh, it may be that the actual mechanism, um, and then some prisons have um, electronic uh, kiosks that prisoners have access to, and it could be that on that they could send an email to an, an independent prison monitor. You couldn't um, demand that in the order because not all prison have access, uh, not all prisoners have access in prisons to uh, being able to send a, a, an electronic message to a, a monitor, but there are two that I can think of where you could do that. So I think, I think it's best uh, left to the implementation um, rather than specing, specifying it I I in the order, I think would be my view. No, I think that makes sense. John Finney, Christian, then Roderick, please. Uh, morning, panel. Um, it's a question for uh, Dr. McManus. Uh, if I noted you correctly, Dr. McManus, you talked about people doing the job a couple of times and you used the, the term <coughs> conspicuous independence. Um, we also heard from the Scottish Human Rights Council about the privacy and privilege afforded prisoners. Now, in a, a submission we've got from the Association of Visiting <coughs> Committees, they say, and I quote here, at present all PVC visits are unannounced and this is more rigorous and consistent with OPCAT. Again, if I noted human rights uh, correctly, they they, they suggested that the unannounced element was one of the what separated OPCAT from one of the other bits of legislation. Can you comment on that? Is the that's the gold star? Is it unannounced visits? I think we all agree that unannounced visits are, are very important, but not all visits need to be unannounced. I think that the, the two are there, uh, and as long as there's a good balance, uh, I don't see any issue. I ask you about a, a further issue uh, as well, please, and that's again a concern raised by the visiting committees, and it's about the abolition of um, employment rights legislation that would free up people to come, and the suggestion, which I personally agree with, that that will thereafter limit the type of person who may come forward, um, and we want people to be representative. Um, do, do you have a view on that? I think it's absolutely clear that if we don't give people the right time off work, we'll get people who are either self-employed and, and able to give up their own uh, unpaid for time, or we'll get retired people, and we'll end up with a, dis a, a group of people who do not reflect the local community, and who certainly would not reflect the age and class distribution of most prisoners, and I think that's quite important. And, and on a practical issue, um, um, Mr Strang, um, Talking about visits, and you said if something was un uh, uncovered, uh, um, uncovered, attend over uh, at other times other than the rota. You suggested it be possible to go out with the rota. What would the implications be for the rota of that? Um, the the order allows for visits out with the time. So that was all I was saying. That the by by specifying that there has to be a a, a rota um, so that every prison is visited every week. That is it in itself is not constraining an independent prison monitor for going in at another time. So the, the, the order allows uh, other visits to be made um, unannounced, as, as we've heard, um, that are not in, in accordance with the rota. So that, that was the point I was making. Mr. Fitzgerald, just a Could your rota for unannounced visits so say a visit as long as a visit takes place in that week? Um, well, it depends who... The, who the rota is shared with, I suppose, as to whether it's unannounced. I mean, yes, you could have um, a, a rota. That's, uh, for instance, within the inspectorate, we have penciled in when we will do an unannounced visit uh, inspection, and we haven't said which establishment we're coming to, so that will be unannounced. A, a word that was used earlier about perception, I think that's terribly important. We've heard very genuine concerns from the visiting committees about... Um, how things could change and how perceptions thereafter could change. Well, I, I think the perception of whether the new independent prison monitoring system is successful or not will be as a result of what they do and what changes follow. So if, um, if monitoring is regular every week in, in a prison, which is what is required in the order, um, and uh, monitors are seen to... Uh, listen to concerns and report uh, on 
uh, on um, w what is going wrong, and those things lead to improvement. So, in, for instance, if there are problems with health care, if there's problems with food, and prisoners learn that by raising it with the monitors, that then action follows, then I think there will be real credibility of it, and, th and the issue about governance will become less uh, relevant. Do you see a place for education, promotion of this in the prison population? Because they're the customers, if you like, and it would be terribly important. Hugely. I mean, I think um, at, at the end of this process, assuming that the independent prison monitors is implemented, then there will be uh, need to, to uh, be a huge amount of work in terms of uh, alerting uh, prisoners to the new scheme, um, in terms of uh, alerting uh, prison staff um, to the new scheme, um, and I mean, I think we've heard a, a couple of times already that um, not all prisoners are aware of visiting committee members, and so we would absolutely want to, to raise uh, the profile of monitors, what their function is, and uh, I would expect to see, as a result, an uptake in, in um, the request to speak to monitors. There seems to be a, a general feeling among people who've been involved in the visiting committees that their, their work isn't valued as a result of the changes that are proposed. Is there anything you think that could be done to reassure people that the public service that has been given and loyally given is appreciated? Um, yes, indeed. And, and that um, view has been expressed to me that... Uh, and I, and I, you know, I can entirely understand if you have spent a lot of time working in, in a visiting committee and then it's announced by the government that visiting committees are to be abolished, you're not going to be feeling, oh, well, my work is really valued. So, I mean, I can entirely understand that. And there's some, I mean, I was in uh, Inverness earlier this year. I spoke to someone who'd been on a visiting committee for 19 years. Um, and that, that's not uh, unique across Scotland. But also, I also hear visiting committee members saying that they welcome the changes because they feel it's a bit ad hoc. They don't get the training. They're not supported. Sometimes their voice is not heard. So, while um, you know, I understand absolutely the, the submission from the Association of Visiting Committees, um, there are others who uh, are keen to be new monitors, and, and I'm expecting and hoping that uh, a number of people who are currently visiting committee members will want to apply to become independent uh, prison monitors. And, um, and I think in, in one way you could see that the fact that... Um, the government stated intention and with the support of this committee that um, independent uh, that, that the notion about monitoring and visiting prisons is not being uh, abolished and abandoned but actually is being enhanced i mean that the reason for this is uh, to uh, improve how monitoring is done and so in a kind of roundabout way i think that visiting committee members should should realize that actually the work they do is hugely important being the eyes and ears of community in a prison in a closed establishment and we know that you know internationally it's recognized that people detained by the state are vulnerable to uh, mistreatment so i think that that role of regular monitoring is hugely important and you know i, I would hope that before visiting committees um uh, end their responsibilities that there will be real acknowledgement for the for the uh, invaluable work that they've done over the years. G given the response that we have heard and you, you, you heard some of the events today, you would acknowledge there's perhaps a way to go with that particular aspect here. Uh, the, there's a lot of uncertainty at the moment. I mean, we, I, I think somebody mentioned four years. I mean, I've been in, in office for 18 months and... Um, you know, I knew when I took up this job that there would be independent prison monitoring coming. That would be my responsibility because that government announcement had been made, and here we are, 18 months on. So I think the uncertainty um, has been has been unhelpful. And I think, you know, I I, I, I was speaking at an event last week and saying, you know, a year from now, if all this goes through, then we'll have it have it all up and running. It be successful and and improve monitoring. Thank you very much. You. you said about informing, uh, letting prisoners know uh, about um, the independent prison monitors, but the Ms. Fraser said that um, information about prison visiting committees reg was regularly removed from boards so that prisoners didn't know. Now, I don't know whether you want to comment on that. You know, uh, did that happen? Has it happened so that prisoners didn't know? If you do know, who took them down? Who took down the notices? Um, or who let the dogs out? You know, I mean, how did it happen? Well, yes, it does, because interestingly, and this is perhaps where you could see the complementarity. When we 
when we inspect, we will make sure that there are notices up about how to make a formal complaint, how to complain about the health service, is the information about the visiting committee uh, number for Samaritans and so on. So we, we make sure that on notice boards and uh, that information is, is up. And, and John Fraser is absolutely right that um, we will sometimes go into a place and find that the, that the information is not there. Now, in terms of, of the new world... He says it's been taken down. Not that it's just not there. Somebody's taken it down. It's a bit different from it just not well, being there. Well, I suppose I was, I was objectively stating that it is no longer there. The, you could infer that it has been taken down rather than it fell down itself. I agree with you. Um, but, you know, one of the things that we would absolutely make sure is that information about the new independent prison monitoring is available. It's given to prisoners at, 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 on admission and through the induction process, and we would make sure that there was regular notice. That, that will be a, you know, a kind of regular check um, and I suppose that, you know, that will be, for instance, a, a coordinator's job is to make sure. And if it's not, I mean, if it's regularly taken down, and I mean, you're suggesting malice on the part of, of prison officers. And if that is happening... I just said, I just said it's... I, <laughs> yeah. I just wanted to know if it's taken down, and if so, sure, sure. to know who's taking it down. So, so um, you know, that will be something that... It, if that were regularly happening, that would be the sort of thing that a coordinator would raise with uh, the, the prison governor, who has now has a duty to cooperate with... Uh, uh, the, the inspection and the monitoring process. Professor Coyle. Uh, Professor Wonder, could I say a brief word about um, Mr Finney's two earlier points, unannounced visits and the, the profile of independent prison monitors. Um, you ask about unannounced rotas. That, in effect, is what exists at the moment. Um, visiting committee members statutorily are obliged to go in, if my memory serves me, twice a month so it, it's for them to decide when within the month they should carry out. They, they will identify which of their members are to go in in November and December, uh, but then they will decide which, which days they go in. So that, in effect, is, is an unannounced uh, rota. Um, and just as an aside on that, my understanding is that the Chief Inspector of Prisons for England and Wales now carries out all his inspections on an unannounced basis. He's decided to go down that road for that's a decision he's made. Um, in terms of equality, we are, having been through all the, um, the pain that we've been through in the last few years, we all, obviously all hope that we come out um, better for the experience. And one of the things that there is agreement, I think, that we need to find uh, is a much more um, diverse membership of independent prison monitors. Um, the reality, as I, I think the AVC said earlier, is that many of the current visiting committee members have, uh, are retired people or people who, who have time, quite frankly, because that's the, that's the nature of what's expected of them. If we're serious that we want um, a diverse profile uh, in terms of all the issues that we're aware of for, for independent prison monitors, and also that might perhaps reflect the clientele that they're looking at, uh, that they're monitoring in prison, then we need to take on board um, the, the issues about the implications. I, uh, in, in my review, um, did not uh, resist the temptation um, to specify a number for each prison. What I did was provide a calculation to say that it would be reasonable to expect an independent prison monitor to go in, let us say, once a fortnight. And I think you would need a consistency like that so that the individual would get the feel for his or her prison. Now, once a fortnight is 26 days a year. If we're asking someone voluntarily to give 26 days a year, then we need to make provision for all the consequences uh, of that public service that we're asking of them. Thank you. Thank you. It's very helpful. Christian, followed by Roderick. Good morning. Uh, just a quick question regarding the uh, comments from the um, Association of Visiting Committee uh, on the timescale of the consultation of the re revised order. Have you got any comments to make? If I may speak briefly, one of the things that, 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 that I have found confusing over the last uh, three years is how does one explain this politely? The dynamics, the dynamics of, of, of the government's position. I think that spoke louder than anything else. I just want to explain. Um, I, mean, I, 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 I put in my evidence to you on the due date, which was the 7th of November, I think, if my memory serves me right. 
And on that 7th of November, after I put my evidence in, the order was laid, and the order which was laid was different from the draft which had been circulated. I learned this morning that an amendment, and it may be technical, you're correct, convener, has, has since been laid. There is really, there is a sense of drift, I have to say. We, we've gone from a position in November 2011 when all prison monitoring was going to be abolished to a position where we were going to have three paid monitors and that was it, and so on and so on and so on. That there is a degree of, of drift which is reactive rather than proactive, and, 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 and I think that doesn't really bode well for, for the future. But we waited a long time for it to come. I, I said in response to Mr. Finney that you know the period of uncertainty is is unhelpful, and uh, so I, I'm looking forward to the, the process being concluded and then getting on with implementing whatever follows. And in order is passed. Talking about period of uncertainty, uh, you've seen that in the revised order we now a period of transitional period of three months. Uh, is that period uh, long enough? And do you think that guidance is some some of the of the previous panel said that some of the guidance should be a statutory level, or do you think that a three month uh, period to embed everything with the guidance is the way they are laid in the in the, in, the, in the order? It's it's strong enough. It's. Uh... I think the the transition period is to do with after the monitoring comes in and. The responsibilities of visiting committees continue. The, the the start date that's proposed here is the end of August, which gives an eight-month period in terms of guidance, recruitment, training, and so on. So, I, and I think that is an adequate time. I, I find myself today, convener, in a bit of a dilemma because as to what I should say to you, because on the one hand, we we have been running through this, I repeat the term, painful process for at least four years and arguably longer. I don't think that serves independent prison monitoring any good. I don't think it serves prisoners any good, and I don't think it serves any good for, for visiting committee members. And there is part of me which says, let's get this signed off and get on with it and, and hold the, uh, the chief inspector's um, fingers to the fire and make sure that, uh, that we, we get everything properly delivered. On the other hand, I'm conscious that once this order is signed off, that's going to be it, uh, as the man said, for a generation or, or for longer. Uh, and therefore, there is an argument for trying to get it as, as, as good as we can at the moment. And there are certainly uh, weaknesses in it as, as it stands. And I suppose it's for you as a committee to, to square that circle. It can't be amended, of course, as, you, as we know. And so if there were changes to be made, it'd have to be a fresh order, as I understand it. So if I pinned you down, as it were, Professor Coyle, metaphorically speaking, of course, and said to, should this be passed or not passed, giving you know, another uh, order to be brought forward with more consultation, what would you do? For, what would you say? I was afraid you were going to ask me that question, convener. Uh, I, ha, had you asked me it, I think, um, a, a week ago, uh, I, I had come to the conclusion, let's get this thing over uh, and, and make, let's make it as good as we can and therefore let the order go through. Um, I, I actually did something very unusual for me and sat up really quite late last night reading all the submissions and going through the official position, the, the, the various submissions which had been put in, issues, for example, like the, getting the governor, governor's approval for, um, for, for, for rotas um, uh, and a variety of other issues which have been mentioned today. Uh, and I have to say, with considerable regret, that it does seem to me that the order does needs further amendment. I say that with great reluctance, and unfortunately, I don't have to make that decision. Um, but we either sign off something that we hope will work uh, with it, with its failings, or we extend the the. If if it's signed off now, my understanding is it will be well into 2015 um, before before changes happen. So we're consigning it to even further in the future. But I just have this fear um, that we'll be signing off something uh, which um, we, w we will say, well, we missed an opportunity there. May I ask that yes, of course. Yes, sorry. Uh, well, I, I 
I think it's in in a fit state, and I think if this were uh, introduced, it would uh, be a robust system for independent prison monitoring and, and would um, fulfil the purposes that uh, are stated in the order. Dr McManus, do you want to... Oh, well, you see, you're one going to get away with just sitting there. You've got to... I was going to try that, Madam, yes. Um, to, to be honest, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm aware that this has been a long and painful process. I guess an Aye. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I'm some... I'm tempted towards the Chief Inspector's position of let's get this going exactly. and, then, and then perhaps we do have to come back in a couple of years' time and say, right, there are fundamental problems which require a new order, but at least we've got something working in the meantime. Um, but I can also see Professor Coyle's approach of let's get it right first. Uh, just, just to know more, I'm in, yes. and the Chief Inspector's <laughs> Slightly o right, thank you, that was helpful. Yes. Just, just to finish that conversation, what do you think the role of the Justice Committee should be uh, in, in, in the years to come on, on that particular order. Monitor the monitors. I know, I know but you know, don't ask uh, witnesses what our rule you, you, is. You, you, you did give some reassurance to the, to the first panel. So I, I, don't know. Uh, I, I, I hear what you have to say. It was very, very valuable. You said, Roderick. Uh, can, can I just perhaps round off by um, bringing back to the question of um, independence and monitoring being complementary but distinct, yet obviously in the order you're at uh, the apex uh, of some of this, uh, um, Mr Strang, and indeed the government thinks you're best placed to really integrate scrutiny and monitoring effectively. Can you provide some kind of reassurance as to how you're going to approach kind of keeping those two things distinct but bringing them together, as it were, if that's not contradictory? Um, I think part of the distinction is that their function is different. Um, so the inspectorate, uh, which, so the inspecting side of the inspectorate is, um, as has been said already, a, a snapshot in time, and it's um, a very detailed, in-depth um, scrutiny. In fact, I started a, an inspection of Perth Prison yesterday, so I've got a team of 11 people in uh, Perth for, for the next fortnight and they're looking at every aspect of prison life. We have a set of standards and, and indicators that we measure against each. We produce a report um, which normally follows uh, two or three months after the inspection uh, and it'll include recommendations and areas of good practice and then that gets reported publicly and then we do follow up inspections and process to, to, to hold the, the prison to account uh, for that. So that, that's the, the inspection process and um, as well as the, the, the prisons inspectorate, I'm joined by um, inspectors from Healthcare Improvement Scotland who look at the um, education, oh, sorry, the, at the Healthcare uh, Education Scotland inspectors join us, and we have someone from the care inspectorate looking at the, at the social work aspect of life in prison. So it's a professional, deep inspection. Monitoring, on the other hand, uh, as we've heard, is, is regular, continuous um, in, in uh, monitoring and what I think what monitors will see is uh, as Andrew Cole said change over time so they will get to know uh, the prison the environment uh, the staff some of the the prisoners who are either there for a long time or, or go in and out sadly and they will get a sense of how things change but only in that one establishment Whereas what the inspectorate does is it's good at comparing against other establishments, which isn't a, a thing that monitors can't do unless they happen to have been a monitor in another prison. Um, and so it, those functions are different. But where it becomes complementary, I think, is that there might be issues that are raised um, of, of, of public concern um, or that have been issues raised in inspections um, that I might ask the monitors to, to look at. So whether to do with health care or quality of food or um, uh, some particular aspect of, of education or exercise or recreation or, or so on. And so it could be that I would invite the monitors to say, well, would you like to monitor over the next three months this aspect of prisons? And then we would get a picture across Scotland of that one aspect. So if, if you like it, it's um, um, kind of invited monitoring uh, and I think that's where the coordination comes in. Or it could be that we get reports from monitors that say, we're concerned about this in, in Glenoka, we're concerned about this in Grampian, we're concerned about this in, in Lomos, 
And that might feed into the in inspectorate's inspection program, say, well, maybe we should do a thematic inspection. Uh, and ne next year in the spring, I'm doing a thematic inspection on the use of segregation and, and isolation in prison, because that's an area of, of um, potential concern. So we're, as an inspectorate, because I haven't got responsibility for monitoring, we are doing a thematic inspection on that. So I can see that's where the benefit of this complementary and, and coordination would come, that there can be information from monitors that would feed the inspection process and, and, and vice versa as well. And then, of course, I'm required in this order to put a, uh, a to report annually on the condition and treatment of prisons and on the effect of monitoring. And, and so, that, so that, in a way, is a, is a new voice for... Uh, monitors that, that uh, the visiting committee don't at the moment they have to produce a report but but um, not much happens with it whereas I think the laying of, of uh, the annual report before Parliament will give a uh, public view to the state of our prisons and how tr uh, prisoners are being treated uh, in a much more visible way. Well I, that uh, concludes this evidence session. I thank you very much for your evidence. Can I say to the committee on the 16th December we'll take evidence from the Scottish Government on the order before deciding whether or not to approve it. Thank you indeed. I suspend for two minutes to allow the changeover. We move back to item three on the agenda. Thank you very much. Uh, we're back to the agenda. Item three, final evidence session of the LCM and the Serious Crime Bill. Uh, welcome to me. I was going to say the late Paul Wheelhouse, but not your fault, uh, Minister, uh, for Community Safety and Legal Affairs and Scottish Government officials. And I congratulate you on your appointment, having insulted you first. Um, I then have Dr Lucy Smith, Head of Organised Crime Strategy, and Leslie, is it Musa? Musa, Human Rights and Third Sector Division, and I believe you're going to make a brief opening statement, Minister. Thank you very much, and good morning, uh, Committee. 
I would like to thank the committee for giving me the opportunity to discuss the uh, provisions of the Serious Crime Bill for which we are seeking consent. As you will be aware, the Serious Crime Bill was introduced to the House of Lords the day after the Queen's speech in early June. It has now progressed through the House of Lords, the House of Commons, with its first reading in that House on the, 7th, the 6th of November. A number of provisions within the Bill are reserved to the UK Parliament, and today I want to discuss the provisions that fall within the devolved competence of this Parliament, and particularly the legislative consent motion that is required to allow the UK Parliament to legislate for those matters. The principal objective of the Bill as a whole is to ensure that law enforcement agencies have effective legal powers to deal with the threat from serious organised crime. Much of this is achieved by updating existing legislation. The motion seeks approval for the UK Parliament to apply provisions in four main areas of the Serious Crime Bill to Scotland. These are uh, amendments to the Proceeds of Crime Act 2002, amendments to the Computer Misuse Act 1990, amendments to the Serious Crime Act 2007 and an amendment to the Female Genital Mutilation Scotland Act 2005. And I'll briefly outline each of these areas. The Scottish Government has undertaken to strengthen proceeds of crime legislation, also referred to as POCA, in this Parliament. Committee members will be aware that although the criminal and civil law are generally devolved, POCA provides for the confiscation and civil recovery of the proceeds of reserve crime, for example, drug trafficking and uh, money laundering, the proceeds of drug trafficking, as well as devolved crime. Because the majority of cases that come to court are for drugs-related offences, the legislation is reserved. Two of the clauses in the Bill, 19 and 23, are measures relating to Scotland that close the gap with the rest of the UK for default sentences and the civil recovery of assets. The Bill includes provisions proposed by the UK Government and which the Scottish Government agrees strengthen the operation of the asset recovery process. The relevant provisions are contained in clauses 15, 16, 17, 18, 20, 21, 22, 37 and 38. The practical impact of amendments within the Bill is that the powers available to both prosecutors and the Civil Recovery Unit at the Crown Office are reinforced through the strengthening of the legislation. Criminal law relating to computer crime found within the Computer Misuse Act 1990 is generally a devolved matter. However, Clause 40 introduces a new offence concerning unauthorised acts causing or creating risk of serious damage, which relates to both reserved, for example, national security and devolved matters. Provision within the Bill also implement the uh, Directive on Attacks Against Information Systems and reduce the threat and impact of cybercrime by ensuring legislation is robust and consistent with other parts of the UK. Back in 2006, this Parliament agreed a legislative consent motion in relation to changes to the Computer Misuse Act 1990 for the reasons given above. We consider it is again appropriate for certain changes to be made in this way and that the Serious Crime Bill presents the most efficient and effective way of transposing the EU Directive's requirements in or as regards Scotland. The Bill amends Part 1 of the Serious Crime Act 2007 to extend Serious Crime Prevention Orders, or SCPOs, to Scotland. These are civil orders that will be used to protect the public by preventing, restricting or disrupting involvement in organised crime in Scotland. The practical impact of SCPOs is that law enforcement agencies will have an additional tool for tackling serious organised crime in Scotland. Amending the Serious Crime Act 2007 to extend SCPOs to Scotland will ensure that the civil orders will be able to cover areas where the Scottish Parliament does not currently have the appropriate legislative competence, areas such as drug trafficking, money laundering, proceeds of drug trafficking, uh, counterfeiting and arms trafficking. Since there are significant overlaps between SCPOs and Financial Reporting Orders, or FROs, which were introduced by way of the Serious Organised Crime and Police Act 2005, the Bill seeks to repeal provisions in that Act for FROs and for Financial Reporting Orders to be imposed through Serious Crime Prevention Orders. The Bill seeks to extend the extraterritorial reach of offences in the 2005 Act so they apply to habitual uh, as well as permanent UK residents. The practical impact of this amendment is the closure of an existing legal loophole. This particular provision is included within the Bill for uh, purposes of speed only and we wish for the identified loophole to be closed as quickly as possible rather than waiting uh, to make the amendment via a specific piece of Scottish primary legislation which I hope the committee would agree with. Uh, while the Scottish Parliament is able to legislate for devolved matters, uh, convener, the legislation being amended by the Serious Crime Bill covers a mixture of reserved and devolved issues. I believe it is sensible for the provisions in the Serious Crime Bill relating to amending POCA, uh, amending the Computer Misuse Act, amending the Serious Crime Act and amending Scottish legislation with respect to closing uh, a loophole relating to female genital mutilation should be dealt with by the UK Parliament on this occasion. I therefore ask the committee to support the draft legislative consent motion laid before you and would happy, uh, happily answer any questions.
Thank you. Margaret Mitchell, John Finney. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Congratulations on your new appointment. Thank you. Um, can I ask about the Proceeds of Crime Act? Um, I note that the bill, the practical effect of the bill, um, the pros, proposed amendments would be to make powers available to prosecutors, reinforce these powers, um, uh, the, re the recovery unit, the civil recovery unit, and other law enforcement agencies. Can the, the Minister um, tell me if this is likely to increase the workload of the, the Crown and Procurator Fiscal Service? Well, um, at this stage, we um, will ha happily come back in writing to the committee about the issue about the workload and in, this, in respect of we don't have any evidence to, uh, to date, at least, to suggest that there would be an increase in the uh, number of restraint orders or, 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 or moves here. Um, so we're not aware of any particular issues that might um, Cost in the future, but we will check with the Crown Office Procurator Fiscal Service if there's any reason to believe that there would be an increased workload on, on the justice authorities in relation to this measure. But I uh, can assure the committee at the moment we don't have any evidence to that effect, so I hope that is of some reassurance, but we'll write back uh, with a more definitive answer on that point. Uh, and just on the issue of empirical evidence, is there any for lowering the test for the granting of the restraint order at the pre-arrest stage? Um, I, I'm not aware of any evidence. If I may convene with your permission, just ask um, Lucy Smith. Session, so. Thank you. Um, uh, Dr Smith might be able to address that point more specifically to uh, the member. Thank you. So this was about the restraint orders yes. more specifically? To suspect and at the pre arrest That's correct, yes. Um, my understanding is, is this uh, is not going to have a significant difference on what restraints may be made. But as Mr Wheelhouse has um, already alluded to, it would be helpful for me to be able to check with my colleagues in the Crown Office um, to, and we could send that back as a respon written response to the committee. Are the Crown Office supportive of these moves under Hawker? Uh, so I they are themselves? I believe so, Convener. Um, certainly, uh, there's been a, a desire um, since 2010, I believe, to try and find a legislative vehicle to bring in these measures. Um, it wasn't possible, unfortunately, in the Crime and Courts 2013 Act to do so when this was um, raised with uh, authorities uh, down south. It wasn't felt to be appropriate, but um, clearly we've taken the first legislative vehicle that was deemed appropriate to do so. And I know um, if I uh, speak for Dr Smith in this in relation, uh, I know Dr Smith and colleagues in the Crown Office Procurator Fiscal Service are keen to, to have these powers to be able to take them forward. Well, as I said, it was are the Crown Office and is the Crown Office. I'm <laughs> being picky about grammar. I better <laughs> correct that on the record. Um, that you? John Finney, please. Okay. Congratulations. Uh, Minister, um, on the question of serious crime prevention orders, um, has the, their effectiveness elsewhere in the UK been measured by the Scottish Government at all, please? Well, if I, if I may, can you just in answering that point, um, I think it would be useful just to cite the evidence of Keith Bristow, who is the, the uh, DG of the National Crime Agency, when he said uh, that um, they've made very effective use of prevention orders and they'll be increasingly important to the way in which uh, we, i.e. the National Crime Agency in this case, tackle organised criminals, and it's certainly something that that uh, we have benefited from in England and Wales. It has seen real benefits for us. It enhanced our ability to disrupt criminals. What I would add, um, is I'm aware uh, that a UK level, rest of UK level, in the last eight years has been 330 cases um, uh, where these have been used, uh, and many have been used for up to five years. Um, anecdotal evidence is uh, the, such that um, if uh, these are used and the individuals concerned are forced to stay above the radar to some extent. That means that they uh, become perhaps less attractive to others in the criminal fraternity to work with, um, if I can put it politely, and they are often shunned indeed by those in the criminal fraternity because they realise it's potentially an avenue by which they could be uh, uh, caught themselves by being associated with individuals who are being kept under close supervision. Um, and uh, were appeals, there have been a number of appeals, um, most of which have uh, been uh, successfully uh, taken forward by, by the authorities, but some have been uh, obviously uh, gone the other direction. Uh, but even when we ha appeal has been lost, this has helped in terms of tightening up the language of the STPOs uh, to make sure that the wording is tighter and they're therefore are more defensible in future. Um, so 
we don't have any um, concerns along the lines that the SCPOs will be uh, in any way, shape or form um, uh, damaging to the interests of pursuing serious crime. In fact, the reverse. We believe these are an important measure that would help um, the justice authorities in Scotland have an additional new tool which would allow them to um, uh, tackle serious organised crime in, in Scotland. And it's worth stating that the, um, from, from the safeguards point of view, that only the Lord Advocate can apply for an SCPO and the court uh, must be con uh, convinced of the case for using an SCPO. So there are safeguards there as well to ensure that it's only applied in appropriate circumstances um, and ensure that it's not used in a frivolous way. But th where these are being used in England, we do have at least anecdotal evidence so far that they are uh, deterring individuals from being involved in crime by the fact they are effectively being shunned by others in the criminal fraternity. I, I was going to say, I, I appreciate the significance that's been afforded, the implications of the, um, uh, the, these orders by the fact that it's only the Lord Advocate that can apply, and, and I do note that uh, you know, application can be made to um, vary some of the terms of them. What assurance can you give, um, Minister, given that a lot of the respondents, quite understandably to the consultation, were concerned about any um, impact on third parties? Um, of, because these are very draconian measures. Everyone would want to take the strongest action against organised crime. But some of these measures could directly or indirectly impact on third parties. What assurance could you give us that that would be monitored? Uh, well, clearly... I I think it is important to monitor the impact of the measure. Uh, as uh, we've uncovered from the comments of Keith Bristol, they have obviously taken a view as to the effectiveness of measures in England. So it would be, um, I think, beholden on, on uh, government and Crown Office Procurator Fiscal Service to monitor the impact of these measures and to know if there are any impacts, unintended consequences on, on third parties. Uh, so I, I will happily uh, you know, come back to the committee, perhaps, just on how we would take that forward. Um, but the, I think the principle is here that we have uh, a measure which can be used to uh, hopefully act as a, as a deterrent to people getting involved in serious crime in the first place. But certainly if they are involved uh, and they are pro successfully prosecuted, then we have a means by which we can uh, make it more difficult for them to uh, commit similar offences in the future. And I think that is a very important measure. But I do take the point that from, from the member that we need to be mindful of the impact, perhaps unintended, on, on third parties who have no criminal um, criminal activity or criminal intent at all, and that's something that uh, we can take forward. I don't know whether, in terms of deliberations on the measure, whether uh, Dr Smith may be able to add anything as to what the Crown Office do propose to do in terms of monitoring the impact in due course. Thank you. Um, I think, as the Minister says, it's something we would need to keep an eye on in any case. Certainly information we've had from south of the border in when SCPOs have been imposed, uh, when they've come to appeal, if there's been any implication on third parties, we've taken a close note on what those impacts may have been. One of the things for serious crime prevention orders that I think we have learned from what's been going on south is that they need to be very specific, very specific about the restrictions. They must be very specific. They mustn't be disproportionate. The intent... This is, this is intended to be a civil order. It is not a punitive measure. It is preventative. It is to prevent someone from being involved in crime or criminality or to disrupt any impact they would have. The court must consider whether or not uh, the risk, what the risk of harm is, and that would be the overriding um, principle on whether a court would agree or not to impose an SCPO. And I think what you raise about third parties is, is, a, is a key part of that. The mechanics of that, if I may, then, um, is this something that the individual who was going to be the subject of this would be aware of in advance and have the opportunity to make representations? Because I can see that that could be a double-edged sword as well if you're trying to disrupt criminal behaviour or perceived criminal behaviour. They would be aware of in advance. <laughs> Sorry, if I, if I may. Um, the majority of SCPOs would be imposed post-conviction, so a court will be going through the case. Through the, a case will be going through the court and as part of that the prosecutor will make application for a serious crime prevention order for the court's consideration that information will clearly be shared with the defence so they will be aware of, of what is being requested and what the, what the restrictions would be and then it would be for the court to decide whether or not to impose one I think if I may if I just add I think that the point that was being made by Dr Smith in relation to and a point alluded to earlier on about refining the wording hopefully over time um, uh, Crown Office and, and, and others will 
be able to refine the wording such that they are quite specific, as Dr Smith has said, and therefore minimise the potential impact on third parties, and also minimise the potential uh, success of an appeal as well by being quite specific um, and, and being able to clearly link the SCPO to the criminality that was being undertaken before. Morning. I congratulate you on your appointment. Afternoon now. Afternoon, <laughs> sorry. It, well, it would have been morning. But, uh, <laughs> uh, thank you, Kavina. Um, we're going to move on to pro prohibition of female genital mutilation and the change in the test uh, to apply to um, individuals who are habitually resident as well as to uh, individuals who are ordinarily resident. Is this a kind of belt and braces exercise or is this a response to kind of evidence that this is actually a problem at the present time. I think, um, in truth, uh, Mr Campbell, it's an important point here. We, we do have, at the moment, a weakness in terms of lack of, of um, robust evidence of the prevalence or likelihood of uh, female genital mutilation in Scotland. Indeed, that's an issue probably UK-wide. Um, there have been relatively few cases taken forward. Um, so this is about trying to minimise the risk, I suppose, uh, that, that such activities could be undertaken. And certainly the perception that there has been justifiably or unjustifiably in the past that perhaps uh, Scotland might be seen as a soft touch if we didn't move to, to standardise in some respects the, the approach we take in Scotland versus that across the UK. So there's two aspects of it. I think one is to avoid any perception that Scotland is any way a soft touch on female genital mutilation. And I think this measure does address that specifically. And then the second issue is to then make sure that we improve the data quality. Now, I'm, I'm aware that uh, the Scottish Refugee Council are due to report, I believe on the 17th of December, um, a draft report has is, is, uh, just been prepared tackling uh, on a report tackling female genital mutilation in Scotland, a Scottish model of intervention. And that report will hopefully set out how we can go about improving the data provision on the prevalence of uh, female, female genital mutilation in Scotland. Uh, so that will be an important part of the process. So we have better data in future and able to monitor what is actually happening. But uh, there's not uh, an, an enormous amount of evidence at this stage uh, of it actually occurring in Scotland, um, uh, which is reassuring. But we've got to be uh, absolutely mindful of the fact there may be hidden from view. So therefore, improving the data uh, will be an extremely important step to take. Um, I never thought I'd be asking uh, Paul Wheelhouse's minister about computing because I know as much about that as I know about under the bonnet of my car. But it's, it's very interesting, this extension of the law in this area where so much crime and problems are committed. And I noticed, and I won't go through it, rehearse the way the Bill amends uh, the CME. One of the interesting things is the extraterritorial jurisdiction of offences, you know, where offences are obviously committed way beyond the UK or even indeed Scotland, but can be prosecuted here. Now, it seems to me that that's a very uh, resource-intensive issue for policing, for detection, for enforcement. Um, how, how, what resources will be required for that, and how will these be shared across the UK, um, the rest of the UK and Scotland, when it's, you know, interjurisdictional is really what I'm getting at. If this is to be worth more than the paper it's written on, or the computer it's typed on, or whatever, you know, uh, how will this be done? Well, this is, this is an important measure in its own right, but it should be seen in the wider context of the sort of cyber strategy uh, for Scotland, which uh, Mr Swinney, uh, in his role as uh, Deputy First Minister and Finance Secretary, will be taking forward on behalf of the Scottish Government. So uh, I can assure um, the committee, I'm sure, that Mr Swinney will be looking very tightly at any, any resource implications for Scotland. We can come back to the committee in due course, uh, convener, with, with any uh, assessment of the financial resource impacts of, of um, policing these issues uh, beyond our borders and obviously how we will work in practical terms with colleagues not only in UK but across Europe in tackling this. Uh, clearly there are uh, established international, international infrastructure there in terms of tackling international crime um, and we can come back to the committee with how this particularly uh, work in a, in a Scottish context. But the police and law enforcement agencies across Scotland do obviously collaborate in a number of cross-border issues, especially clearly where this is a, a, a reserved matter, but where there's a clear um, uh, uh, you know, joining of, of, of um, our synergy, if you like, and working together to try and address um, challenges which not only face um, you know, Scottish companies, but 
companies which operate across Scotland, England, Wales, Northern Ireland, and indeed Europe and the world um, from threats of cyber crime. Um, and I think the important measures that are being brought in, in, in the, uh, through the LCM are, are going to enable us to tackle those that perhaps are intending to commit such a crime um, and um, are, are beyond our current, uh, current reach. This does more than aligning uh, the Scottish um, crimes and protection orders in Scotland with what there is in the rest of the UK. This actually is a fairly robust amendment to the Computer Misuse Act 1990. It doesn't just make it the same. Really quite. There's a bit in it here that says, by creating a new indictable offence uh, of committing an unauthorised act in relation to computer, that results either directly or indirectly in serious damage to the computer. That's a, quite a... Quite a difficult test. What would the defence be? I mean, somebody might be completely unaware that they've put something in that's a significant risk, for example, let's say to human welfare or whatever. Um, will this be on the um, beyond reasonable doubt test in criminal law? I'm taking it, is it? I'm just, I mean, it's quite, you know, the rest are easy directly, but indirectly you might be doing something and not know. Uh, what you've done has had this impact, the law of unintended consequences. I'm not thinking about something I might do, by the yeah. way. I'm not looking for a defence, <laughs> but just how, how that would work. No, I, I understand the concern and the need to be uh, clear about what, what, can, uh, what can happen. But I suppose if you uh, had someone who created, deliberately created perhaps a, a computer virus, but not with the intent of taking down the air traffic control system, yeah. but it took down the air traffic control system, and cause uh, either fatalities or, or massive economic damage, then that would be something I think that you would you would take, take very seriously. So I mean, I maybe ask um, uh, Dr. Smith if she's aware of any specific examples that were being thought about in framing this legislation. I don't know if there are any that have been considered, but uh, certainly in this provision um, would allow us to to tackle uh, you know perhaps um, those activities which are designed to uh, to damage. Um, IT systems, but not specifically to damage a particular economic interest or a particular sector or a particular uh, user of technology, but had that impact and serious perhaps uh, damage resulted from it. If I can maybe uh, invite Dr. Smith, can you just to see if there's any specific examples we have thought about in this context? Um, un unfortunately, I'm, I'm unaware of, of any specific examples. I think it is, as, as Mr. Wheelhouse um, has, has set out. Um, but certainly, I can I can go back and and come forward with with specific examples if that would be helpful to the yeah, committee. I must be thinking mm -hmm. about why that's there and what is something that's sure. a defensible. A child, for sure. instance, yeah, a ten year old, uh -huh. who manages to bring down air traffic control to take your example, but doesn't you? Know, obviously, there would be a difference there. But there'll be yeah. a grey area, um, at, at which you know maybe somebody quite innocent um, finds themselves falling foul. I don't want to mm -hmm. defend people who are up to mischief. Yes. Do you want it to go into that? I mean, Lane knows more about computing than I do. <laughs> That's not difficult. <laughs> Thank you, Kavina. Yeah, I, I picked this bit up as well about um, obtaining a tool for use in committing a CMA offence regardless of an intention to supply that tool. I know that's actually a requirement of the EU directive anyway. But, you know, somebody could, for example, um, write a piece of software which is benign in its initial use, but thereafter is used by somebody else in a way which is more malign. And I'm just wondering what sort of protection would be there for the person who possibly wrote a piece of software without any ill intention whatsoever. Yes, yeah, so it's just badly designed software. Mm. Or, or like, by some, you know, it's incorporated into something else which is, is malign in its, its purpose. I, I do take the point. I mean, it's, it's something that uh, clearly we... We, uh, I can take from the, the number of comments that have been made that the committee would welcome some clarification on, and we, we will uh, try and seek some of the, some clarification from the uh, uh, the uh, UK ministers and indeed um, uh, Crown Office, Procurator Fiscal Service, if there are any cases they're aware of that, where this might have applied or which maybe haven't been able to prosecute uh, in the past, but perhaps could do with provision of this uh, this amendment. Um, I suppose it's uh, you know the, much of the much of the provision deals with those who are um, illegally uh, accessing or interfering with a computer system and, and therefore sort of hacking in or doing something of that nature rather than doing something which is 
you know, completely accidental um, uh, and perhaps designing something on their home computer which somehow or other escapes their home computer and works, ends up in the, the wider system. But So I, I take the, the, ex the extreme end of the spectrum that pertains to someone who quite legit legitimately accidentally does something. But I think these measures are designed to deal with situ situations where there's at least some intent to cause harm uh, and it just happens to be uh, uh, perhaps uh, unintended uh, victims that fall victim to that harm. Defence now have decided just in case. <laughs> but no, it would be very useful, seriously, to have the thinking behind those areas where it's indirectly and where it's not been, you know, uh, uh, the actions have not. It's not obvious that the actions were purposely um, damaging and criminal. Point absolutely happy to come back. Thank with you. That. Well, thank you very much. And uh, that concludes this evidence session. Thank you, Minister, for your attendance. I say to the committee, our next meeting is on the 8th of December when we'll consider draft reports on this particular uh, bill. Uh, so we kind of need a little bit of information um, prior to that. Uh, and on the draft budget 2015-16, we'll also consider our work programme. And can I remind members, as if I have to, that the human rights debate will take place this Thursday afternoon. The motion has been lodged to the chamber desk and... Committee members may wish to support the motion before the debate. You're invited oh, right. to, to support the motion. I'll lead for the committee and John Finney will uh, sum up for the committee. Thank you very much. That's the close of business.